All righty. Welcome, everybody, back to another episode of the Ball Knower Podcast Team Preview Series. I'm your host, as always, David Miller, joined today by, I keep pointing the wrong way, joined today by my boy Jackson, who is apparently the self-proclaimed biggest Drake hater of all time. Uh, so first of all, why? Why do we hate Drake? I'm with you, but what is your reasoning for hating Drake? Um, I, well, for anyone watching, we just wasted about two and a half minutes talking Let, about Why are you going to do me like that? Why are you going to do me like that? <laughs> Sorry. We got to have viewer authenticity here. Mm-hmm. Um, but essentially to, uh, to recap the conversation, I think Drake is incredibly corny. Um, I like when he, when he kind of sticks to his like pop element, like, yeah. um, a lot of the hits that he's cranked out, I, I think are pretty good. But once you get deeper into his discography, especially as of recent, um, I think that he tries too hard to act like he is from the streets, like he is from the hood and he is from like a suburb in Toronto and it's just not something I can get behind. And that like that stupid heart that he has shaved into his head mm-hmm. is, is just like activity that if anyone that I knew did that, I would be making fun of him pretty hard. So Valid. yeah, yeah, I, I've I, never I understood can't, the I can't Drake get behind either. it. I can't either. Oh, yeah. He's got like three good verses and then the rest of his music, like you said, it's either poppy or sucks. So Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's horrid, Uh, but we're not here to talk about Drake. Thankfully we're here to talk about the Seattle Seahawks, obviously. So you can see with the 12th man sitting behind my boy's head. So I think the perfect place to, to start here is to talk about the biggest move of the off season for the team, which is obviously the Russell Wilson trade. So just kind of a, as an overall thought, how did you feel about the trade? Do you think it was a good trade? Do you think it was time for Russ to move on? Just how do you feel about it as a whole? Well, before the trade, I was very much advocating in like November-ish, saying that Seattle, it is in their best interest to trade Russell Wilson. And when it happened, I was just shocked. Like I was in, I was basically in denial and I couldn't process it. Um, but but as it went on, I, I thought like, yeah, this was definitely a good move. Um, the thing that I like to compare it to is the the Jared Goff trade, the Matt Stafford Jared Goff swap, um, where the full trade there was Rams gave up two firsts and Jared Goff, and the Lions gave up Matt Stafford and ended up having to pay pretty much most of Goff's massive overpay contract. And Seattle gave up a ca- uh, quarterback who was a very similar caliber to Stafford, um, except they got two firsts, two seconds, uh, Shelby Harris, Drew Locke, and Noah Fant. So we got an absolute back without having to pay. I-, I guess we are paying a good amount of Russell Wilson's contract, especially this year. But even then, we got a lot more in return for a very similar caliber player. And this roster was just not at a point where we were going to be contending with Russ. He had two more years left on his deal, and you had two paths. You either play out those two years. Um, after that, he was going to want Mahomes-type money, which we just weren't going to be able to afford. Play out those two years with a pretty weak roster, uh, maybe a wild card appearance or two, but you're not getting to the Super Bowl. And in my opinion, the overall goal is to win Super Bowls. If you are consistently reaching the – conference championship you are not succeeding as a team like winning the super bowl is the ultimate goal and you need to be shooting for that so you either do that or you go down the path where it's trade him now get all of that capital and restart everything and set yourself up in a position where you will probably be a lot more likely to win a super bowl in the future so these next year this next year or two is probably going to be kind of rough obviously this roster still has lots of holes um, but I think overall this move was a win, and I'm really glad that this front office had the stones to trade away your longtime franchise quarterback because I really think that this is benefiting this team in the long run. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm sure it sucks as a Seahawks fan. Like you said at the beginning, you were in denial, but it had to happen. This yeah. was the best case scenario for both sides, and I am still to this day shocked they got the return they did for Russ especially like you said, after the Matthew Stafford trade, getting two very quality starters, whatever we want to call Drew Locke, who we can talk about in a minute. I know that's your boy. The franchise already. quarterback. Sure. If that's the word we want to hear, <laughs> the phrase we want to use. And uh, what what was the draft return again? Two first, two seconds? Yeah, two first, two seconds, and a fifth. Like, that's insane. 
That is absolutely bonkers for a quarterback who had one of the rougher years of his career last year, which granted he's going to ba- bounce back. He's Russ. He's still a great quarterback, but that return was absolutely incredible and it needed to happen. Like you said, this team was not going anywhere with Russ. He was going to want big time money long-term and they they're just not in a position to do that. They have way too many holes as we uh, saw in what we're going to talk about next. Uh, so yeah, it's, it, it was definitely the right move, but move both ways. Uh, now, I got to bring it up because me and you were chirping back and forth on Twitter the other night. The Bears-Seahawks mm-hmm. preseason game that was – Gosh. It, it was a football game, that's for sure. One that I enjoyed not quite Not from a us. Bit. That was not football <laughs> that we played. That was some of the worst offense I have ever seen. I think that the only positive that came from that game is that Geno Smith has played himself out of the starting job. Because, yeah. like, on tape and in terms of the scheme, it is very clear that Locke should be our starting quarterback. Certainly. And I, I thought with with COVID, as long as Gino played like a semi decent game, this starting job was his because this coaching staff just loves him and thinks he fits with the scheme so much more. But man, he is trash, and it, it was very clear. Like on your second and third team defense, we scored zero points. Like he he didn't, or maybe I think he led us to. Yeah, you guys yeah, scored one points. touchdown on the third team defense. And, and that wasn't even with Gino. Yeah. It was, and it was with, uh, Jacob Easton. Yeah. And like Geno Smith led us into field goal range and then we missed a field goal. So that's not necessarily his <laughs> fault. But regardless, like that was some of the worst offense I've ever seen from an NFL team, even in preseason. Like most of our starters were in. That was completely unacceptable. And as long as Locke like looks like a good quarterback, like looks like what he did against the Steelers, he should win this job. Yeah, I I think the quarterback situation here is so goofy, first of all, because we're talking about trash and slightly shinier trash, basically. Um, And trust me, I know the feeling. I was listening to Trubisky and Foles debates for for like a year and a half in Chicago, and I, I know the feeling of two crappy quarterbacks going at it, but this situation, I mean... Like you said, Gino just doesn't fit the scheme, doesn't fit the offense they're going for. It's very much uh, McVay. Well, very much is McVay uh, coming from that tree. I can't remember the offensive coordinator's name off the top of my head. Um, Dane Waldron. Yeah, Waldron. Coming from that Shanahan wide zone, play action, heavy type of scheme. That's just not Gino. But Drew Locke, that's into a key. You get him outside of the pocket, let him throw one play action, short, easy, quick reads. Uh, nothing too complicated. I mean, it's it's Locke can execute that offense. You know, he's not a stud, but he can execute that offense. Where you have Geno, who takes a little bit too long in the pocket, doesn't want to put. Uh, what's the word I'm looking for here? Uh, or stretch the field even a little there bit. It is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's not what I was yeah. going for, but you're right. Um, <laughs> no, I was trying to say he just doesn't like to get the ball out quick. He spends a little bit too much time in the pocket. And you can't be doing that in this type of offense. And like you said, he can't stretch the field to save his life, which isn't going to work when you have DK Metcalf and uh, uh, Tyler Lockett as your, no- or as your top two receivers. He just doesn't fit at all. Like, yeah, he looked okay in a couple games last year. He kept you in a couple games last year in a season that meant nothing. But you can't commit to him. He's not a quarterback you can look at as your long-term option. And Drew Locke, maybe he isn't your long-term option either. I personally don't think he is. But at least you can try him out and see if he can do something. And worst case, you're picking in the top two and you end up with uh, Bryce Young or CJ Stroud. And everybody wins, except for Drew Locke, I guess. But uh, it's it's an interesting quarterback debacle in Seattle. And uh, I'm sorry you have to watch it. I, I really am. (laughs) <laughs> it's not going to be a good year. I'm not as pessimistic. I'm a pretty pessimistic fan, but in terms of the quarterback situation, I'm not as pessimistic as most other Seahawks fans. And I guess the NFL in general is, especially if Locke wins the starting job. I've watched most of, I've watched all of his games that he played this last year in 2021. Um, all of his preseason snaps, obviously, and some of uh, 2020. And I think that there is something there. This front office really loves him, and I think people are really overlooking the possibility that he could very well be our starting quarterback next year. Like, I would not be too entirely surprised if we don't draft at least a first-round quarterback next season because Locke is raw, and the only thing that he does not have as an advantage as these other rookie quarterbacks is – He's going to be expensive. Like after this is the last year on his deal and he doesn't have that first round option. 
Um, so we're going to have to extend him. But I think if he looks good enough, this front office is into him enough. And I think that he was a much more major part of the trade than people are giving him credit for. I, I would not be surprised if this front office decides to move forward and says, Drew Locke, you are going to be our starting quarterback next year. Yeah. I mean, I, I think you'd really have to see something out of Locke this year, and he'd really have to take a step up, obviously. But even then, if you guys end up with a top two or three pick, I really don't know if they're going to be able to resist one of those quarterbacks, unless somehow all of them suck, which I doubt happens. I, I really don't see a world where they uh, you know, overlook the possibility of one of those guys in favor of Drew Locke, of all people. But who knows, maybe with this type of system, he could look good enough and they could be like, you know what, we'll try it out. Maybe you guys go out and get like Will Anderson with one of those top picks, which would be kind of nasty or. Uh, it would be so awesome. <laughs> I was going to say JSN, but that doesn't really make sense with the with the receiver core you already have. Yeah, that's, um, just, that's just not really a need for us right now. I mean, who knows? Maybe they go wild. They just want everything around drew lock to be a hundred percent perfect that way if he messes up you know it's him no i i do think maybe in some some sense there's a possibility that could be the case but i i really don't see it being likely because he's to me even if you can disguise some of his weaknesses he's still like a first read quarterback that can't step up in the pocket that can't deliver throws a hundred percent of the time. He struggles under pressure. Like there's, there's still a lot with Drew Locke that needs fixed. And he's how old now? Like 25, 26. He is going into his fourth season. So right. I don't Either, know actually what age that makes him. Right. But. So regardless of age going into year four, you expect that to be there by now. And it's not. So unless Drew Locke, is a completely different quarterback this year. I don't think that's going to be the case. Mm-hmm. It's uh, I know you're going to be pushing for Drew Locke all season, but I, I really think it's a lost cause. Well, I really I, I'm definitely pushing him over Geno Smith. Uh, he just fits yeah. our offensive identity a little bit more. I The thing about him in terms of the future is like all of those flaws that you said are definitely there, but they're all issues that like rookie quarterbacks tend to have. And that he just never really ironed out in Mm -hmm. Denver. And one of, I I was looking into Trey Lance's development. And one of the things that I found is that last year, his, his quarterback coach, Rich Scangarello, um, he was with Denver before he became the Niners quarterback coach. And he was on the team when Locke came in for the last like four or five games and looked like a dark horse MVP candidate going into next season. Like he was, I think going into the 2020 season, I think it was, um, he was probably the most popular. If you were to ask people who is your dark horse MVP candidate, he was probably the most popular answer. Like, and then and then Skangarello left the Broncos offense, and everything with Locke just went downhill from there. Like the development was just super stunted, and like he kind of just wasted these last two years. He didn't really get much better. Um, but I think if Seattle is able to iron off enough of those flaws, I think it's a possibility we extend them. But like you said, it would need to be a lot, a lot of cleanup for us to say we're willing to pay you the $10, $11 million, whatever it takes to be our starting quarterback next year. Like we have that trust. I don't know that it's going to happen. I just think the Seattle fans need to keep an open mind because I think it's very much on the table. Okay. I can see where you're coming from there. Uh, We got to remember though, uh, the dark horse thing. I have heard that with so many garbage quarterbacks that looked good for like two games. Case in point, Mitch Trubisky. I have heard him as a dark horse MVP candidate more times than any man ever should have. So I get where you're coming from there. I understand it. And I don't know who the quarterbacks coach in Seattle is right now, but maybe if he can pull something together, uh, I'll look real goofy for hating on Drew Locke. But I feel like this is one of my safer takes that I'm not going to have to worry about that with, unfortunately. Yeah. But, it, it, even it's a thing like if you're wrong, like so is everyone else. Right. Right. Yeah. <laughs> how how cool would it be for you to be the only one to be right about Drew Locke, though? I mean, that would be. How I, much I, shit I, would you talk? Like, dude, be honest. So much. I would, I would have such a superiority <laughs> complex going forward because like. 
this was one of my more like highly researched takes and with how out there it is like with how many people have just counted him out and basically think of him as like a Sam Darnold caliber quarterback I, don't think I would be that like bad. well well if you look at NFL Twitter a lot well, you're of looking, that's your first mistake first of all you're looking <laughs> at NFL Twitter yeah <laughs> you're looking at NFL Twitter and thinking you're going to get dignified opinions that's fair. That's fair. But but um I have seen lots of people who are just very much like counting him out yeah. uh, all over any social media, I guess. And I think it like with the research that I put in, I think that there is something there. Um, but I, I'm not saying he's gonna be this top ten, like legit, no. legit caliber. Like he can function in this offense, especially with how big of a running identity we're gonna have. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think that people just need to have a more open mind with him, I guess okay. that's what I should be saying. Fair enough. Maybe I need to go back and do my homework on Drew Locke a little bit more. Maybe I'm missing I, something. I can do Maybe a I'm the review. one in the wrong. Please do, I can do a Listen, film. Okay. do a okay. film review on Drew Locke. All right. Tag me in it. Make sure the people know it was my idea and my inspiration. <laughs> I want all the credit. I'll, I'll it intro it with this clip right here. Perfect. I'm going to post this clip and then it will lead awesome. right into a Drew Locke film review. Awesome. Okay. Um, but like I said about the quarterbacks coach that uh, seems to be key in this situation, I don't know much about him, but what I do know about is the big three coaches here, Pete Carroll, Sean Desai, and I'm forgetting his name, Shane Waldron. I keep forgetting his damn name. Dude, he's uh, a forgettable name. I had, I had to like, yeah. I, I was thinking about this, like probably – 30 minutes ago and i'd be like oh my god what's our offensive coordinator's name again <laughs> i keep forgetting <Yeah>. it <laughs> but uh waldron's going into year two with uh pete carroll right yes yeah okay and then you got sean desai coming over from chicago so how do you feel about your head coach and two coordinators here in seattle well pete carroll is interesting he um obviously led us to like our best team ever our only super bowl um but then the 2016 through 2021 were kind of dead years because it was just time where he refused to adapt to the current roster situation. Like we had so many people from the Legion of Boom leave and the defensive philosophies just didn't change like at all. And so we just saw very like almost like high level mediocrity where we were like low level playoff teams. Like we were still yeah. good teams, but Oh, excuse me. Never had the <laughs> caliber, never had the caliber yeah. to make it to like another Super Bowl or anything like that. So I think we're starting to see that kind of shift, especially with the, mm-hmm. the rush trade and letting go of Wagner. Um, and now we're that's another possibility or another, oh my gosh, benefit, I guess. Sorry, I lost the word. Another benefit of getting rid of Russ is he's finally gonna be able to run the offense that he wants to run in terms of establishing the run game. Um, in order to kind of set up the play action and then there's easy reads because through like three or four different offensive coordinators with Russ, his play style didn't change at all. Like he never threw over the middle, always threw outside the numbers and he kept throwing that moon ball, no matter like how much it was implemented into the offense, Russ's play style just never changed. And I think now with Locke and our total running identity team, like Penny Walker, All those guys are going to get legit carries. I think we're going to run the ball 30 to 35 times a game, and that is exactly what Pete Carroll wants to do. Um, Waldron, I think, is a really great fit for this team because obviously, like I just said, we're going to be running the ball a lot. And the first thing that I noticed when he came in is how incredible his running schemes are because for – It's that tree. It's oh, everyone yeah. out of that yeah. tree. They all know how it's, to run the ball incredible. extremely well. Yes, yeah, and and that is exactly what we need. Um, I would say the passing game was there for our offense about 85 – or passing game was not there for our offense for about 85% of last season between Russell Wilson coming back way too fast off of his injury and how lackluster Geno Smith was. No matter what, we still had a rushing identity, and usually the case is like when the passing game gets shut down, so will the running game because defense is going to stack the box. You're going to see less too high safety formations. Um, and that was not the case with us. We were able to still run the ball very, very effectively. And I think now that Russ is gone and our quarterback situation is a little bit more clear, we're able to open up the scheme. We're, we're able to tailor it to this offense a little bit more. 
I think that this running game is going to be very incredible, and Waldron is definitely the mastermind behind that. Um, from the defensive side of our coaching tree, you you mentioned Sean Desai. He's kind of a co-coordinator right now. Yeah. Um, He's a, I, I the associate coach, I think, is his position title. It's something weird. Yes. Yeah, it's like... But to my understanding, yeah, no, no. he's the one that's actually going to be calling the plays and running the defense. And maybe I'm wrong, but from what yeah. I've seen, that's what my understanding was. Yeah, he's... I, I think you're right about the play calling, but his main role in terms of, like, constructing the defense is going to be the secondary and, right. like, passing looks, whereas Clint Hurt who is our actual defensive coordinator is going to be more in charge of the front seven and blitz packages and okay. all of those kinds of stuff. And I, I think those two complement each other really well. I really like Desai coming out of your Chicago bears. I think that he just fits well with our secondary and Clint hurt. I am really hopeful for, he was a guy that our guys in the locker room just loved. Like they were big fans of him. And when we had to fire Ken Norton, who needed to be fired, he was trash. A lot of guys in the locker room vouched for Clint Hurt, and Pete Carroll promoted him to defensive coordinator. Um, and I'm really hopeful now that we're moving to a 3-4 scheme. Our pass rush has been one of the only like main bright spots when you look at both of our preseason games. We were able to generate pressure, particularly mm -hmm. off the edge in guys like Uchenna and Wosu, Boye Mafe, Daryl Taylor. Those guys were flying off the edge at super consistent rates. Um, and then there's guys like Jamal Adams, Jordan Brooks, where like the tools are there. You can have some super creative blitz packages that would be mm -hmm. really, really helpful to this defense. Like the tools are there. And I think Clint Hurt is a really good choice for the guy to be able to innovate those. So in terms of the coaching staff right now, I am optimistic. I like what we have, um, but I will need to see some regular season games before I officially like – Right. Have an opinion. Like, that's just kind of my preliminary thoughts. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I agree with what you said at the start with Pete Carroll. He's very much a stuck in his ways type of coach. And it finally feels like he's adapting to everything going on. Because it just, he was clinging so hard to the Legion of Boom. He, he absolutely refused to give up. And we even saw that this year with the draft. I mean, Tariq Woolen would have been the epitome of a type of corner that you want in that type he of defense. He is Richard Sherman. He, he exactly. Richard he's, Sherman. he's Richard Sherman. And now in this like quarters, uh, not qu what's the word I'm looking for here? It's primarily quarters coverage uh, that you're getting from uh, Sean Desai. He doesn't quite fit at all. Like he just doesn't have the uh, the high IQ that you want. He doesn't have the short area quickness that you want. He's not quite yeah. as good against the run. It, like it's very clear that Pete Carroll's old school what he wants influence is still there. But by bringing in Desai, uh, bringing in Waldron, I almost forgot his name again. He is ready to take that next step. He got rid of Russ. We got rid of Wagner. He is ready to embrace modern football finally, like six years too late, which I mean, I guess better late than never, but it's still concerning. Um, I'm almost surprised that to a certain extent, I suppose that Pete Carroll didn't just leave with Russ just because I feel like most of the time when you see a franchise quarterback go, the coach follows suit. Um, and Pete Carroll's what, 70 years old now. He yeah, really yeah, doesn't have much longer uh, as a head coach in the NFL. And he's already got a hall of fame resume. So like, I, I am surprised to a certain extent that he didn't leave, but then again, I don't think Pete's going to go out on a bad note unless it's like detrimental that he goes out, I guess. So you're kind of stuck with them, but if he's going to let these guys take over, if he's going to let Desai and Waldron and the defensive coordinator, I can't remember his name. Uh, if he's going to let them take over, then so be it. You know, that's, that's going to help a lot. And Waldron's going to play a big role, like you said, in setting up the run game with his wide zone scheme. Uh, the only thing I don't like about him is he doesn't use the fullback, unfortunately, because that's <laughs> kind of the difference between the McVay versus the Shanahan tree, where the guys who well, were under McVay. Nick Fuller is there. Nick he's Fuller there, is in but the he building. played, what, 20 <laughs> snaps last year? Less than yeah. 5%. Like, it's it, he's a special teams guy for you guys. It makes yeah, me mad because exactly. Fuller's good. The talent's there. I have him as a top 13 fullback. Like, he is that guy. And he's such a great dude off the field, too. Between two Belors is hysterical. I love him. Oh, I know. Yeah, but like, he's, he's a very funny, like, locker room guy. Yeah. But they just they just don't use him. Like I said, less than 5% uh, of snaps last year, 20 total. 
it's it's just the difference in the McVeigh versus the Shanahan tree because the guys coming out of McVeigh, you're going to see a lot more of uh, uh, three wide eleven personnel looks, and you're not really fitting a fullback into that, unfortunately. Um, so it's 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 going to be interesting to see what the offense looks like this year with Drew Locke, like you said, very run heavy. And then the defense, I'm super excited to see what Desai is going to be able to do with the secondary because I don't have a lot of faith in the names there outside of like Quandre Diggs and. Uh, uh, Jamal Adams, outside of the two of them, it's just kind of whatever. So I'm curious to see what he's going to come up with. But um, it, it'll definitely be interesting. And I know you like uh, Big Fangio. I remember you did your film breakdown on Fangio's defense and how incredible it is. And it, you basically got his disciple, his right-hand man, the next coming, so to speak, the man that was uh, personally trained by Fangio to take over Chicago's defense. And it just didn't work out for him because they wanted to bring in Eberflus. So... It'll it'll definitely be interesting to see what he's able to do with Seattle, and I'm excited to see what uh, the defense and the run game and whatnot will look for it, like for this team because the pass game is going to be whatever. Uh, so, yeah. it, it'll, I don't know. It'll be fun. Um, even if the season's bad, you'll see some progression and whatnot. And at the end of the day, that's what you want to see, I suppose. Yeah, I'm not even looking for wins this year. I just want to see right. some young guys perform well. Yeah, I'm. I mean, I'm in the same boat. Obviously, as a Bears fan. And speaking of young guys, let's talk about this draft class, where you did the smart thing, surprisingly, and took your franchise tackle in the first <laughs> round. A lot of people were doubtful that that would happen. I saw a surprising amount of people not mocking them offensive line in the first round just based off that. Like I saw everything from a receiver to Jordan Davis to some of the linebackers even like I saw some wild shit for the Seahawks uh, mock drafts and whatnot, but they did the right thing. They went with Charles cross, followed it up with Boye Mafe, Kenneth Walker, Abraham Lucas, Kobe Bryant, Tariq Woolen, Tyreek Smith and Bo Melton, who I absolutely adore. So we'll just kind of go pick by pick here, starting out with Charles cross. What were your thoughts here? Well, I think at pick nine, there were like a couple guys that I wanted on the board, but by the time it came to us, Charles Cross was the only one left. And so it kind of felt like this has to be your pick here. And like you said, you saw those wild rumors. Like I saw people saying that Seattle really likes penning and could go with him at nine. Oh, and that, yeah, that would have been rough. Um, there were some people saying like nine would be the place to take a quarterback like Ritter or mm -hmm. Malik Willis. Um but I thought Cross was the only right option to take at nine, like in terms of PFF grade. And obviously, PFF may not be the greatest site. Yeah, but we, in terms of like, we constantly slaughter PFF like, on this podcast. Don't praise yeah, PFF. Yeah, yeah. Uh, this isn't praise. This is a praise. Um, but like, okay. it's hard to scout offensive. Like, I didn't scout. Right. No, you I, I get what you're going with. Yeah, it's it's yeah, fine to use like, PFF like for PFF, offensive PFF, line grades. Yeah, yeah. It's, His it's passing. Fine. His pass protection grade was the highest in the class and mm -hmm. still had a pretty high run protection grade. Um, I think that it was probably the biggest need, uh, considering Dwayne Brown was very old and we were not going to re-sign him. Um, and he also just so, got arrested, right? Or am I thinking of a different did. offense? Yes, okay, yeah. it was him. Yeah. No, 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 you're right. He, he, he was the guy that just signed with the Jets, but he tried to like sneak a gun through LAX yeah. security. And yes, Um so I think Charles Cross was like the only correct mm -hmm. pick. And I'm glad like the Seahawks are just known for absolutely blowing those situations and especially early in the draft. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm glad that we finally went with the conventional pick because I would have been really mad if we didn't. Yeah, I agree completely. I think Cross was probably the safest out of the linemen in terms of pass protection. Like, you know, you look at a guy like Evan Neal or Ikea Kwanu and you probably like how they project a little bit better. But Charles Cross has the fundamentals as a pass protector down to a T. He's perfect. His hand placement is perfect. His base is perfect. He stays square perfectly. Uh, he's very strong and accurate with his hands. He's really good at getting his hands inside and making the right type of moves. He's great. The only concern with him is the run blocking, and it's not even his fault. It's just the system he was in. He wasn't doing a whole lot of it, which, like you said already, this is going to be a run-heavy team, so we're going to find out pretty damn quick if he's able to do it because um, we saw – a lot of him in like a, a two point stance run blocking, which is so weird to me. Uh, I don't watch a ton of college football. So seeing stuff like that is just completely foreign, but he's going to have his hand in the dirt this year. He's going to be a mauler. I mean, he's got the athleticism to get downfield and pop a linebacker or set a block on the outside, hold that rush or whatever. Well, not hold, hopefully. I mean, we did see some of that yeah. in that Bears game, but. Oh my uh, gosh. Five <laughs> penalties, I think. I think five. From him alone? 
Yes. Yeah. Oh, did oh what? My gosh. He How did I miss that? The, he had three false starts in the oh first my half. God. And then I think it was two in the second half, but it might have been only one. Yeah. No, he looked really sharp against the Steelers and like just could not stop committing penalties against you guys. Who was he going up against for the Bears? I can't even remember. Yeah, I'm not sure. Was it Don- I, no, a little it Don- bit of it was um a little bit was what's his name? Your guy's main pass rusher. Why am I uh, Quinn? Yeah, he he okay, had one Quinn rep where he won against. It was like a one rep sample size that he won against Quinn, and then the rest of the game it was just penalty after penalty after penalty. Right. Yeah, I knew the line got called for called for a lot of penalties. It was a very sloppy game by them, but I didn't realize Charles Cross was that many. He was almost all of them. I know why I was getting confused because he or why I didn't realize it. He's wearing sixty seven, right? Yeah, my brain doesn't register 67 as a tackle. Exactly. That's a guard number. Yeah, exactly. It doesn't Mm -hmm. register my brain as a tackle. I'm a real stickler for the numbers in the NFL. So I like there's some Bears corner wearing 16 and I'm praying to God he gets cut. Because if I see that (laughs) in the season game, I'm going to be so pissed. But yeah, like he's a hell of a tackle. And you're you want him to, I guess, clean up the penalties a little bit, which I'm sure he will. He's a smart kid. Uh God, I shouldn't be calling offensive linemen. Yeah, it, <laughs> I'm not there yet. I do it all the time. I got like two more years before I can do that, which is scary to say. Um, but yeah, he's he's fantastic. I love Charles Cross. I think he's going to be yeah. great for you guys. And then we go to, what was the next pick? It was Mafe. And this Mafe. is one I had a, a bit of an issue with. I think you overdrafted a little bit personally, but what were your thoughts? Yeah, so the last time that we talked about this, I was like very low on Mafe and I've become, I've come around a little more, especially seeing with how good of a preseason he's had. Um, he definitely fits the three, four style mm-hmm. offense, but with how high of capital you're spending, I would like to see him carve a larger role in the defense. Exactly. He Like, I don't think he will be a three down starter like uh, Daryl Taylor and Uchenna and Wosu both play like his exact role. And, I yeah. don't think he's beating either of those guys out. He's going to get some rotational time. Um, but rotational time is something I want to see from like a third or fourth rounder. Yeah, that's like Tyreek and, Smith that you want to see that from. Not yes, the yeah, exactly. top 50 pick. It's ridiculous. That's my exact problem as well. Yeah. I agree completely. Um, and it'd be one thing if he was like really young and raw and he was just kind of sitting to develop a little bit more. But this dude is 23. Like yeah. he's on the older – end of the spectrum as rookies go like i don't think his ceiling is as high i wasn't a fan of this pick he'll definitely get some time like he's looked good within our scheme but um you expect more out of Mm -hmm. such a high capital pick and apparently our guy was arnold ebiketti as he should have been like he he fits that exact prototype what i'm talking about like Mm -hmm. someone who's young and gonna go in and get time and then the Falcons jumped like three picks ahead of us and snagged him out from under us. Um, yeah. So we kind of just had to settle there. Um, and he'll be like, he'll be solid for us this year. Solid uh, rotational pass rusher, but I don't know. That's not satisfying enough for a high second round pick. Yeah, I agree completely. Like we're looking at a guy, his physical tools are exciting. And like you said, if he was a developmental prospect, absolutely. Fantastic pick. But we're talking about a 23-year-old edge rusher who has zero element of power to his game whatsoever, isn't technically refined, uh, isn't really good against the run, doesn't have any pop in his hands, but, like, he's got a high motor. There's that. Like, uh, he, he's got flexible hips. He's got an above-average first step. He's just he's, he's just okay. Like you said, he's a rotational edge at best, and you're taking that in the top 50, and it just doesn't work. Like I said, if we're talking about Tyreek Smith here, who I think is incredibly close to Mafe in his skill level, like, like, like I think the two of them are very comparable players, and you took Smith in what, the, the fourth, fifth round? Fifth round, fifth round. Yeah, like that's the right place to take that player, and yeah. I think that's why the Seahawks doubled down, because they, re- like you said, they panicked and just took the first edge rusher they saw or whatever, their highest rated one, and then they took Tyreek Smith later on because you're like, well – if this guy doesn't pan out, we'll take the exact same player three rounds later and maybe he'll pan out. And then when he pans out, we'll look smart. You know, like it's, I don't know. I don't know. I I didn't understand the pick outside of it just being a complete panic pick. Um, But then they turn around in the second round and absolutely knock it out of the park with the next pick with Kenneth Walker, which got way too much shit when it first happened, because as we all know now, it was insurance for Chris Carson. 
And I think we probably should have realized that sooner. Like I can remember hating on the pick right away, not thinking about Chris Carson and his neck, which thank God he retired. If he would have played another snap of football, I would have been so scared for that man's life because I, I mean, we've seen the, the pictures of his neck and the big metal brace he has going down the side of his spine, like one wrong hit. And that thing breaks. He's, he's, he's never, never walking, walking again. again. <laughs> exactly. Like it's, it, it was good that he retired. And I like the Seahawks, how they handled it. They gave him that settlement at the very end. Like that, that was yeah. good practice, mm-hmm. but Kenneth Walker, I mean, I'll let you talk about him first. But he's such a fucking stud. He's such a good football player. Yeah. And I think that kind of speaks to how good that this draft class, oh my gosh, draft class was from Seattle because he was mm-hmm. our only like very controversial pick after the draft. And it had nothing to do with how good of a player he was. It mm-hmm. was just because like the running back room looked a little bit too deep. But like you said, like when I first saw the pick, when I was watching on TV, I went, ah, like I was mad. And then I looked at Twitter that's, and it's like, your this mad? is not a good sign for Chris. Hold on, that's <laughs> your mad reaction? Ah! <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it was a little more dramatized than that. I, was, I'm sure, uh, I, I would hope. Because if that's your reaction <laughs> to a draft pick, you're like a 1960s sitcom character. <laughs> <laughs> that's funny. Um, but yes, that was not my exact reaction. Just a little, uh, little example. I was going to say, you need to get in touch with your drama department and work on your acting skills. Yeah. Um, But then I immediately went on Twitter and saw someone was like, this is not a good sign for Chris Carson's injury. And I had honestly completely forgot about that. Like, Mm -hmm. I kind of thought it as something, some like weird stinger where he would just be ready. And then I thought about like, this is a neck injury. We saw guys like Cliff Averill and Cam Chancellor have to retire from this. That is probably going to be the case with Carson. And I immediately fell in love with the pick because going into the draft, he was my running back one. It was kind of a tie between him and Brees Hall. Mm -hmm. But I think I gave the edge to him because he was a better runner than Brees Hall, in my opinion. But Brees Hall just had the pass blocking upside. And this pass blocking from a running back is not something that we are necessarily going to be needing in this style of offense. Um So I love Walker. I think he's going to command a lot of carries this year. I could definitely see him getting work out of the receiving game, especially if Geno Smith ends up winning the starting job because it feels like the dump off is his first read like 60% of the time. Um, But I think that he should definitely carve out a legit role, especially with how injury prone Penny is and just the running back position in general. Like he is going to be that next guy up, no question and should definitely see some pretty solid production regardless of who else is in that running back room. Yeah, I I like Walker a lot. And I think just completely unrelated to his skill set, my favorite part about this Walker pick is that it hurts anyone's Rashad Penny agendas because I am am slowly becoming a Rashad Penny hater because we'll we'll talk about him in a minute. We'll talk about him in a minute. Okay. We'll get to him in a minute. But I, I had Kenneth Walker as my RB too. I like Brees Hall, like you said, as a pass protector and as a receiver. I liked his upside a little bit more. And I think in today's NFL, that matters a little bit more. But Kenneth Walker as a pure runner is definitely the better football player. And I think what's interesting about him is he was playing very much in a inside zone power run scheme in college, but he always wanted to bounce it to the outside. It's like he couldn't hit a hole up the middle. So his first instinct was to hit it outside. And now he's coming to Seattle, which is an outside zone, wide zone running scheme. He fits perfectly. It was the perfect pick for them. He's super explosive. His wiggle in space is like generational. The way that kid can move is insane. I did it again. God damn it. Anyways, <laughs> that little guy. <laughs> <laughs> that little fella, yeah. He's got 4-4 four, four speed. He, he's just incredible. The only concern I have with him is we're not super familiar with his ability as a receiver just because he wasn't asked to do it. But I don't think that'll be an issue given his ability after the like after first contact. When he's in the open field, he can make guys miss. He can make plays. So maybe, like you said, if he's going to be in the flat at dump off, if his hands are solid enough, he, he can be a stud. Like, I, I'm really interested to see how he projects as a pass catcher, but as a runner, I have no complaints whatsoever. I think he's incredible. Yes, I agree. So what was the next pick? It was uh, was Lucas next? It be, it, yes, it was It was Abraham. I don't know if it's Abraham. or It's Abraham. It's yeah. Abraham. Okay, okay. Yeah, Abraham Lucas. How do you not uh, know your own right tackle's first name? Because, what kind because of casual I, fan I are those, you? It's just those two 
names like Abram and Abraham. I mix up all. How many Abrams do you know? Other than Jonathan Abram, really? You'd be be surprised, man. Yeah, a couple. Uh, Um, Okay, interesting. Sorry, yeah, it's like all the Abrams of the world. I always, yeah. Um, but. Uh, like we talked about earlier, this is going to be a super run heavy offense. And this guy was one of the best run blockers in Mm -hmm. the draft class by far. He's just kind of raw, um, and is going to take a little while before he really solidifies himself as a legit tackle in the league. But this team is not going anywhere right now. Like raw prospect. We have the time for him to develop. We don't need him to be great right now. We can have him develop for a little while. And I really do believe that we have found our franchise cornerstones at Charles cross and Abraham Lucas. Like he is just nasty in the run game. He's looked pretty solid in both preseason outings so far, especially against the Steelers because pretty much nothing looks solid against you guys. (laughs) Um, But I'm very hopeful. I think that he has a very legit chance to win the starting job. He's probably looked the best out of anyone at our right tackle position in preseason. And if you are drafting a guy in the third round because he's a little too raw and then goes out and wins the starting job, like what more could you ask for out of him? So I really do like this pick, especially because uh, both of our tackles last year ended up leaving Brandon Shell and Dwayne Brown and, now we have a guy who looks like we might be able to plug him in right now. And that would be incredible based on where we got him from. I really like what we have in Abe Lucas going forward. Yeah, I think he's got to be your starter at this point. I don't think there's a world where he doesn't start. Because your other tackles, it's what? Stone Forsyth, he sucks. And yeah, um, it'll be him him or Jake Curhan. Yeah, and Curhan's. Curhan's garbage too. Yeah. Like I, I, I don't have much faith in either of those tackles. So he, he should be the starter and getting those reps year one in an offense. Like you said, you're not competing for anything. That's great for his development. And like you said, he's a fantastic run blocker. He's an even better pass blocker. Like he is. I, I agree completely. Him and Cross are your franchise cornerstones at tackle. You guys knocked it out of the park there. And I think it's crazy that you guys managed to get who I think is your running back of the future ahead of Rashad Penny. And your two franchise tackle uh, franchise tackles within the first three rounds of the draft this year. They absolutely killed it there, minus the Boye Mafe pick. Yeah, that one is. Uh, I, I liked it when it happened, but then I kind of thought about it again. Like right. I feel like my preliminary thoughts, like right when we draft someone, often change. And I agree. That was one of those where it happened. I mean, I think most people are like that. Yeah, unless it's yeah. like home run obvious pick, like the Bears getting Justin like like Charles Field, Cross. You know? Yeah, like yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, so from there, fourth round, Kobe Bryant, uh, what were your thoughts here? Cause I like Kobe. I think he's solid. Yeah. I like Kobe too. Um, I think that he is a very safe prospect. Um, and that's something that you would like to get in the fourth round. That's, that's definitely a good value pick. He was at Cincinnati and went up with sauce Gardner as his teammate and sauce Gardner, obviously being maybe the cornerback one out of this class. I like Stingley a little bit better, Um, but in terms of like, he wasn't playing very much in terms of like, who was the best cornerback in college football this season? It was probably sauce Gardner. Um, when you are going up with someone like that, you are going to get tested a lot because quarterbacks don't want to aim Gardner's way. And he held his own by Mm -hmm. all means. He won. I don't remember the exact name of the award, but it was like the award for the best, um, cornerback in college Hold football on, let me look it up real like quick, wooden, it's like me. wooden award maybe i don't i don't know what it is but um or thorpe award thorpe award yeah i, I think it's the thorpe award that sounds thorpe, right uh, we'll go with that i okay um he won that award and to be able to get a player like that in the fourth yeah round the jim thorpe is, award you were right jim thorpe award. Oh, I, I, there we go <laughs> um to, to be able to get a player like that out of the fourth round is really incredible. I think that he should be our I, – I think he sees some time this year, at least in, like, dime packages. Mm-hmm. Um, he has had a pretty rough preseason. Like, he was the one who just got bullied by George Pickens in that Steelers game. But in camp, he's looked incredible, and I really do think once he gets a little more time um, yeah. getting NFL-quality snaps – I think that he'll pan out and be at least like a high level cornerback too. 
Um, and as long as we can get someone else on that other side, the secondary should be pretty good for the future. Yeah, I agree. I don't like to do player comparisons just because I feel like it's it's a mostly redundant thing because no player is going to be exactly the same as another. But I will say he reminds me a lot of Rasul Douglas in the best way possible. I mean that like breakout Rasul Douglas for Green Bay last year, who ironically had his breakout in the same exact type of defense that the Seahawks are going to be running this year. So I think the the likelihood for Kobe Bryant to emerge as a piece in the secondary, especially given how weak the cornerback room is for this team, is very high. I think we're going to hear a lot of Kobe Bryant, which is great, by the way. Uh, his name, wearing the number eight. I love him. I'm rooting for him oh, so yeah. hard. Oh, yeah. And Already I, a fan favorite. Like, oh, that, that, absolutely. Yeah, you can't yeah. not be a fan favorite. Uh-huh. Um, but he's, he's, he's just such a smart and instinctive ball player. He sinks his hips really well. He breaks on the ball really well. His ball skills as a whole are great. Um, he's he's really willing to fight with uh, wide receivers as well and like press man coverage and whatnot, uh, even though he's not going to be doing a whole lot of that uh, in this type of defense. So... I, I'm really interested to see what he's going to be able to do, but I have high expectations and high hopes for him just because I think he fits this defense so well. And it was Tyreek Smith, the next pick here. I can't remember if it no, was, it was, Smith it, or was Woolen. Woolen. it was, was Woolen. it Woolen. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that's our, that's our other cornerback prospect. And he mm -hmm. is very different from Kobe Bryant in that he's not safe by any means, no. but he has the athletic profile to be, a truly, truly awesome cornerback in this league. He has the athletic um, profile to be a goddamn generational talent, and I'll buy oh, yeah. him that hill. I oh, love yeah. Tariq Woolen, but I hate yeah. that he ended up in Seattle because he just not fit your defense in the fifth at round. All. Too, like, like with that high of a ceiling, if you're getting that yeah. high of a ceiling in the fifth round, that's an awesome pick. Um, the four-two speed, his technique was rough at mm -hmm. UTSC. I don't remember the exact name of the college that he went to. I don't know. Some um, fucking no-name school. It doesn't matter. Yeah, yeah. But his technique was really rough. He's a converted wide receiver. Yeah. Reminds me a ton of Richard Sherman, and we all know how that panned out for Seattle. Mm -hmm. um, and and Sherman is in the building now, helping him out with his technique, and I think that's really going to be huge for him because he can transform him into a legit generational cornerback like you said um he's looked he's been the star of training camp so far like if you look up any Seahawks beat reporter Tariq Woolen is probably going to be the most frequent name you're going to find because he was just making highlight plays over and over and over again um when he has been in actual coverage he's looked awesome like in that Steelers game is the main one I point to because that's the one he got tested the most um he had some just like mental errors. Like there was one yeah. touchdown. It was their opening drive touchdown where we were playing cover three and he just decided to play man on a drag route. And it just took him all the way across the field from where he was supposed to be. And they just had that whole like left side of the end zone was wide open. Yeah. Um, just kind of a blown coverage play, but a uh, rookie mistake that you can get behind and moving forward. He should cut, should cut down on that. Um, but when he was in like man coverage on George Pickens, who's probably been the biggest like rookie name thus far out of preseason, he looked awesome. Like he was right on his hip. And I have very high expectations going forward. I think next year, maybe in two years, he should definitely be a starting quarterback, cornerback. Oh my gosh. It's because um, that would be a big change for the kid. Yeah, yeah. No, he's our franchise guy. Screw Drew Lock. Screw Brett there you go. We, we found there you our go. Man. Um, no, but um, I think that our left side cornerback within the next two years will be Tariq Woolen, and I think that he is going to be a big name in this league by the end of his rookie contract. I agree completely. I, I love Tariq Woolen. Like I said, I, I might have even been a little bit too high on him because when I was doing my mock drafts, uh, even here on YouTube. I, I had him going in like the early second, late first, even at times. Like I am insanely high on this dude. I absolutely love his athletic traits. He's big and he's fast. You don't see that very, he's like what six, four and ran like a four, three or something stupid four three four four. I think he ran a four, two. I think it was a four, two, six. No shot. Time. Correct. Yeah. I, oh, it was sub four, what? three. I know Hold it was on. sub four three. Hold on. You gotta you gotta you gotta validate this. Yeah, I gotta double check. It's not that I don't believe you, I just need to see it with my own eyes. <laughs> I think it was four two six, but it's in the four twos. 
four two six. Holy shit! <laughs> yeah, man, he's fast. Oh my god, with that height and his intelligence, his awareness, uh, yeah. his ball skills, even he. Oh yeah. Let me put it this way: his ball skills are like if Trayvon Diggs was patient. Play coverage. That's what he. If Trayvon Diggs could cover somebody, thing ever, yeah. yeah. <laughs> like that's the thing about him he's so great at forcing turnovers and he's got a great nose for the ball but he's patient he doesn't just jump at everything like Trayvon Diggs does he has the awareness he knows when to jump and when not to although he I will say he gambles a little bit like that that is definitely something that shows up on tape but it's not Trayvon Diggs level and if you can get somebody that has the upside of forcing the interceptions like Trayvon Diggs did or at least making the plays he did with a little bit less of the gambling aspect and more of just him knowing what's going on. Oh my God, he's going to be incredible. But like you said, the technique doesn't need work. He's a little bit sloppy. He's a little stiff at times, but if they can develop him, Oh my God. It'd be awesome. I'm like, I said, I'm a little upset. He went to Seattle. Cause I feel like there are defenses. He would fit a little bit better in just because they're starting to, they're finally moving away from the Legion of boom. And they just came across Richard Sherman. Like you said, but yeah. I, I still think he's going to be a demon in Seattle, and I do think he's going to make a massive name for himself on this team. Yeah. I think he's going to be yeah. incredible. I mean, like, like think about it this way. <clears throat> like, we were talking about how Seattle probably found both franchise cornerstones at tackle. Imagine if they have also found both franchise cornerbacks plus Kenneth Walker. Like, that is an incredible, incredible draft. Oh, my class. God. I – Oh my like god. That is how you rebuild. That exactly. That is how you rebuild. Um and then moving on from that, a prospect that I'm not quite as high on, uh Tariq Smith. I like I like I said earlier, he's just kind of boye mafe, but looks a little bit better on tape and isn't quite as athletic. That's kind of my evaluation of him. Yeah, he like again, he'll be one of those kind of outside edge rushers on uh, three, four scheme, um, mm -hmm. speed off the edge. He's not as athletic as Mafe or any of our starting edges for that matter, but, um, he's raw. He, that is kind of a spot where you would have liked to take a guy like Mafe because, uh, um, right. I like Mafe obviously just does not have the development there yet. Um, but Smith, I can't be too mad at it considering the value that we gave up to get him. Um, probably another just rotational pass rush player. Um, our two main guys will be in Wosu and Taylor mm -hmm. off the edge, but he'll get some time. Um, I think that he is going to thrive in some of these blitz packages where we like overload the right side and then he kind of just flies off the left. Um, and he's got like, like you said, not super athletic, but he's got enough speed to get it done mm -hmm. enough bend to get it done. Mm -hmm. Um, not much to say about this pick because it's not super high ceiling, not super low floor. Um, yeah. He'll be kind of just that mediocre player. Like I said, him and Boy Mafe just scream rotational pass rusher. And like that's fine for a fifth round pick, but taking Mafe in the top 50, I just can't I just can't put my head around it, man. Like I I'm not going to say that. I get it. I get why it happened. Like you said they panicked, but still you, you got to be able to recover better than that as a general manager. Yeah, yeah, I don't know. But if everything else pans out, it won't matter. Um, but their last pick, uh, you want to talk about the opposite of Mafe, taking somebody who plummeted, in my opinion. At least, I would say at least two rounds he fell. That's Bo Melton, who I am yeah. absolutely enamored with. I love Bo Melton. Um, yeah, Melton was... I wasn't super familiar with his name come draft time, but he's a super I'll be fun totally player. honest. I only knew about him because of Brett Coleman. It's not like I found this kid on my own. So Okay, okay. Like it's it's um, you're not wrong for doing that. He went to what, Rutgers? Like nobody's watching receivers at Rutgers. Nobody normal. Yeah. Yeah. But I heard um, about a Brett Coleman video once and I was obsessed with him. Yeah, yeah. So he he's a very fun type of player. Like mm -hmm. you could definitely see him being morphed in to some kind of Debo type role. Um, but in preseason, he has had time. He's been very volatile where like yeah. he's had multiple, just bad drops and like bad play. And then multiple times where he creates like 35 yards after the catch. Like yeah. he, if he gets a little bit more carved out, I guess um, he'll find a role in this offense as the wide receiver three. Mm -hmm. And I think 
he or the the next pick, I think one of those two will be kind of a guy that makes it a lot easier for Waldron to be super creative with this offense because they're just super plug and play. We'll create after the catch and hard for defenses to stop because if you have that kind of versatility on a defense between deep threats like DK and Lockett who can seriously stretch the field and then give it to a gadget guy underneath to create like that is awesome. That's an awesome way to run an offense because that's just so many different avenues for a, a defense to have to stop. Like, so, so if he pans out, he will be a major help for this offense. Um, but in terms of how he's looked in preseason, I haven't seriously looked at his like route running or anything, um, but definitely has some holes in his game that he needs to iron out before yeah. we're going to see anything like that. Yeah, and that's kind of the thing with Bo Melton. He is, I, I'm not going to call him a pure gadget guy, but he's not somebody you're going to rely on as a fantastic route runner or somebody you want taking 50-50 balls down the sideline or anything like that. He's just really, really explosive after the catch. If you can get him the ball short on a drag or some sort of screen or anything like that, like you said, he's going to create 35, 40 yards after the catch. He is incredible. He ran, what, a 4-3? He has 4-3 speed. Uh, He's very tough. He's very scrappy. He's got that high motor, high grit to him, even though he doesn't quite fit the stereotype. He's (laughs) he's awesome. He's awesome. I absolutely love Bo. And I think... Uh, I saw someone the other day bring this up that he can be the modern version, like not the same play style, but a more modernized version of the long lineage of like little Seattle receivers that just do work. Like Percy Harvin. Yes. Yeah. I, well, I I was more going the route of like the slot guys. Like I said, it's not the same exact play style, but just the little guys that do work like Doug Baldwin or Tyler Lockett or Golden Tate. Like I said, it's, it's the modern version because he's he's not some route runner over the middle slow guy. He's flipped, but he's your late Uh round little dude who does work for you. I know it's a weird comparison, but I wanted to bring that up just to hype Bo Melton up uh, in any way I can. (laughs) Uh, And then I believe they made one more pick, right? If yes, it was another receiver, Derek Young. Yeah, I'm going to be honest. I'm not super familiar with his game, so I'm going to let you take this one. He is He's super similar to Melton. Like These last two picks kind of just felt like an attempt to get a guy like that, and since it's a seventh-round pick, like it's no guarantee they hit. Um, right. I think that they just wanted a player like similar to that play style and just hope one of those guys hits okay. right now. It looks a lot more likely to be Melton than it is Young, um, but he came from like another some like some weird college, is like Lenoir or something like that, <laughs> okay. um, like total no name school. Um, but you could see Derek Young in all kinds of like end arounds or weird gadget plays and stuff like that, like something that could you could definitely see like opening up an offense for. And again, if you have all of that kind of versatility it's just so hard for a defense to have to stop so many different things because you can't plan for all those things you as a defense you hope to stop their like two or three main offensive strategies and if if you even do that that is a big big win um but if melton or young or any of these other guys can kind of create that other facet of attacking uh, it, it would be great, but I don't know. Derek Young has had lots of drops. He really has not played incredible during the preseason. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if he gets cut and gets thrown onto the practice squad. Okay. Um, I, I really don't see him making the team right now, uh, but we'll see. He This pick kind of just felt like a desperate attempt to get to have either him or Melton hit because they just right. want someone of that play style. Okay. Yeah, like I said, I don't know much about him, but he ran like a 4-4. I do know that. So he's quick, and he fits that mold. So, I don't know. It's not a bad pick. Seventh-round pick, like you said. Just throwing something at the wall, hoping it sticks. And worst case, you get Melton to work out of the two. So I guess from there, uh, we can kind of go through and look at this roster, evaluate some of the talent that's already there, that's been there. And we already talked about the quarterback, so I think the next logical step is to talk about the receiver room. Obviously, starring DK Metcalf, who got paid, uh, which was one of the big reasons why we wanted to re-record this podcast, because we had already recorded it beforehand with uh, two other people who unfortunately couldn't be here. But um, 
we we wanted to re-record it because a lot of the conversation in that podcast was about DK Metcalf and him whether or not he deserved to get extended, which I think we all agreed he did. I, I don't think there was anyone on this planet that didn't think he deserved to get extended, other than maybe a couple way too optimistic Bears fans that thought we would be able to trade for him <laughs> somehow, some way. I, I swear to God, I've heard more about DK Metcalf than I have about Darnell Mooney from the Chicago Bears Twitter uh, yeah. over the past like three months. It's it, it's crazy. And like as soon as the Roquan news broke as well, it was like, oh, okay, so we're trading him to Seattle for – like, yeah, no, yeah, he's they gone. just extended him. <laughs> <laughs> they just accepted it. Why the hell would they trade him for a linebacker of all things? Like, shut. I hate Bears Twitter. I hate Bears fans. I, I am yeah. the one Bears fan who hates Bears fans because they are all delusional and uh, idiotic and they don't know yeah, what they're talking I, about. I can definitely relate to that as a Seahawks fan because, like, Seahawks fans are delusional in the sense that we are a team that in the last decade has had a major season where we were, like, the team to hop on the bandwagon for. And so there's so many fans that just joined in then and their expectations have been so incredibly high since that year. And they think every like minor move that we make is just this total like diamond in the rough. Like this is going to send us to the Super Bowl. It, it They're just like way, way too optimistic. Bears fans are like that, but we don't have a bandwagon year to claim. Because they're just desperately like yeah. searching for wins. Yeah. <laughs> we're searching for the whys. That's what it was. Yeah. That was Matt Nagy's thing. We were searching for the whys, and we never found them, unfortunately. Oh, um, man. Yeah, we're still looking. Uh, which, <laughs> another thing about Bears Twitter real quick, just to go on another rant. Uh, both games we've played so far against the Chiefs and the Seahawks, we have – interacted with a former coach, obviously Nagy with the Chiefs and then Desai with the Seahawks. And they see Bears players talking to those coaches, which is like understandable. You played for them for years and it's automatically, oh, he wants traded. He wants out. He doesn't want to play for this team anymore. <laughs> like David Montgomery was talking to Matt Nagy during the first preseason game. They were like, well, Monty's not yeah. getting extended. He's going to be a Nagy's Chief a guy you, just, you want to chase. Oh yeah, you just can't get enough of him. He's a mastermind that you, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> There was one picture though where Nagy and uh, Nagy and Justin Fields hugged, and Fields looked like dead inside. <laughs> it was the funniest <laughs> shit in the world. Like it was like that one uncle that you see at the family reunions that you're you like, have to okay. be nice to. Let's get this yeah, you're like hey, this. yeah, exactly. That was the vibe <laughs> that came from it. But no, because David Montgomery spoke to him, he once traded, or because yeah, Roquan was speaking to his old DC that he's been with since. He came into the league. He's a Seahawk now. It shut the fuck mm. up. <laughs> I I hate fans. But anyways, back to the Seahawks. Uh, talking about the receiver room. Uh, how how do you feel about it? I'm I'm sure you feel pretty damn good because this is a great group. Uh yeah, definitely. I really like what we've got going for. In terms of DK's extension, um, I really like the value that we got. My mm -hmm. only complaint was that it was too short. Um, and I think that's yeah. part of the reason why it was being held up for so long, um, because we've seen how just inflated that this wide receiver market has been getting. And if you can get him at the twenty-four million a year that we that paid him, right? Something like that. Um, if you can get him for that price for another year, that is five years where DK is probably undervalued in terms of his AAV. Um, so that would have been nice, but I can't complain. Um, we have another four years of Metcalf, and I think that he is going to play a very, very large role in this offense. As we've been talking about this episode, it is going to be very Sean McVay-esque in terms of like play action, easy reads. Mm -hmm. And if anyone is creating after the catch on this receiving court, it is DK Metcalf, the absolute physical specimen who mm -hmm. can run you over like Derrick Henry and can outrun you like Tyreek Hill. Um, I think if we get the ball and kind of just let him cook in that space, he is going to do really, really great things for this mm -hmm. offense. In terms of Lockett, I am not as high on. I'm higher on him than when we last talked about him. Yeah. Um, but I think Lockett is going to be a guy who has a ton of receptions and not a lot of yards. Because another thing that you're going to see in McVay's offense is a slot receiver who just finds like short dead areas yeah. in the zones and that's exactly what cooper cup did except mm -hmm. cooper cup is able to create after the catch and yeah. lockett just can't like i think lockett's gonna have kind of like a jalen waddle season in that he just catches tons and tons of tons of short passes 
and doesn't really create a ton of yards after. Um, so that's kind of what I'm expecting out of him. In terms of the rest, it's really foggy right now. Our wide receiver three is really up for grabs. It could be Dwayne Eskridge. It could be Freddie Swain, Penny Hart, uh, maybe Melton if he steps it up these next few weeks. Um, I don't really know what to expect from that, but um, I like what this receiver room is. I like what we're working with here. Obviously, you got two big name stars and some solid depth. So we're going to have some nice pass catchers for sure. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I, I agree completely. You have DK Metcalf, who is probably the best deep threat in football right now, other than like Tyree Kill. Uh, but he, he's a different type of deep threat. He brings the physicality. You're not going to see Tyreek Hill go up and moss somebody, but DK's got the size and the frame and the ability to do that. And he's really good after the catch as well, which I feel like a lot of people overlook, uh, which is so funny considering like one of his biggest complaints before the draft was he ran a bad three cone, so he can't move after the catch, even though he's... That's true. Right, right. But that was like... Yeah. I don't, I don't know if you remember. I'm probably underestimating. Oh, oh how I old totally you remember. I, I remember that process. So, like, he had like okay. the greatest combine ever. But his and three then, cone was dog then came the three cone drill, and then everyone was yeah. just out. Like, we got him with the very last pick in the second round. Yeah. And there was a point where he was looking like a potential top five pick. Okay. And a lot of NFL GMs saw the yeah. three cone and just tapped out. I didn't mean any offense by that, by the way. I just under oh, oh, how, how, how young you are. Yeah. yeah. No, no, that's like, not how I took it. I'm sorry. Yeah, I, just, yeah. I got no, sorry. no. You're good. You're good. You're good. I know. I just wanted to point that out. Um, but yeah, he's incredible. And then you got Lockett, who I still stand by what we said the last time we spoke. I think he, if the Seahawks, I'll put it this way. I think it's changed a little bit. If the Seahawks are not in a good place by midseason, which they probably won't be, I think you explore trade options at the deadline. I think some contender would absolutely trade for Tyler Lockett. I think. I don't know who off the top of my head, but there's probably some contending team out there that could use an incredible deep threat that has some of the best ball tracking ability in football can go up on people and catch passes, uh, even though he's like tiny, like he, he's, he's an incredible deep threat and a really good route runner. And I'm sure somebody out there would be able to find use for him and maybe Seattle gets a third round pick out of him, And you can kind of promote DF Scridge to that wide receiver too, who is kind of like a baby locket in a way. Uh, that's kind of how I would describe him. But I'm, I'm interested to see what Eskridge is going to be, because if I'm not mistaken, he didn't play much last year because he got hurt early on. Yeah, he had, like, a really, really bad concussion. Yeah. Missed, like, seven games or something, and then we just really yeah. didn't see much from him after that. Yeah. But he, like I said, he's baby Tyler Lockett. He's just not quite as good with uh, tracking the ball and getting the ball in his hands. But in terms of his route running ability and things like that, he, he can fill the role. Um, and I know ball tracking is like kind of a meme on NFL Twitter, but like Lockett is one of those guys. React uh, yeah. Like, if, if anyone could do it, it's like Lockett and McLaurin. Are exactly. The yeah. Yeah. Um, but outside of that, like you said, you've got Freddie Swain, who's just kind of a smooth uh, route runner. He can do a little bit of everything. He's very balanced. Uh, you added Goodwin, who I didn't know until I was looking at the depth chart. A super, super fast guy, Olympic sprinter speed, but he can't do anything else. <laughs> Um, and then you've got, oh, shit, I can't remember his first name. Hold on, hold on. I got this. I got this. No, I don't. Whoever Thompson oh, is. Man. I wrote down Thompson, but oh, I didn't get his first Cody name. Cody Thompson, I think. Cody Thompson. I think yeah. it's Cody Thompson. I saw someone uh, when I was doing research for this describe him as an intermediate aficionado, and I just wanted to use that phrase because I thought that was hysterical. Like, it's true. He's very good in, like, the, the middle of the field. But referring yeah. to him as an intermediate aficionado, aficionado. out of Toledo. <laughs> yeah. They added out of Toledo to it. I thought that was funny. Um, yeah. But, yeah, like, you've got a deep receiver room. Like, you could probably house seven receivers on the final 53. And that, mm -hmm. especially when you, like you said, you have a wide receiver three position that's very much up for grabs. That should help the team out a lot. And I think it'll be very interesting to see what comes of this receiver room. I'm I'm very excited for what we have going forward with this. Yeah. And then the tight end room, uh, we'll go there and then we'll backtrack to the running back so I can rant about Rashad okay. Penny. Okay. Uh, I, I love this too. I love Noah Fant. Will Disley's a fantastic blocking tight end, top 10 as a blocker at that position. Kobe Parkinson is a solid like third tight end. He can do a little bit of work there. Uh, but I know Noah Fant's a little bit 
I don't want to say controversial, but maybe not appreciated as much as he should be because he has some inconsistency issues. Uh, so how do you feel about him? Yeah, uh, I really like Noah Fant. Um, he does. I, I think he's pretty similar to our main receiving tight end last year, Everett, in terms of mm -hmm. like how good he can be in the receiving game. Um, but he is pretty inconsistent. Like one of our games against the 49ers, Everett had like an absolute disaster class. Like there was a game where he dropped two passes that turned into interceptions and fumbled that they, and, and like fumbled where they recovered it. it like he mm -hmm. cost us three possessions and like the inconsistency is there. Maybe not to that much of a degree, um, but Fant is like almost like a receiver. Like, yeah, he can go up and and catch a pass, catch like a jump ball really well. Creates mm -hmm. after the catch. He's super athletic and super physical. Yeah, he ran like um, a four I, or five. I, yeah, yeah, I really Crazy. like what he has to offer um, from that. And then Disley, like you said, one of the best blocking tight ends in the league. Uh, his contract extension this last offseason got a lot of hate because it was kind of an overpay. It was three years, twenty four mil. But if you actually look at the like year by year breakdown. He is only making $3 million this year, and then everything else is backloaded to the last two years. Okay. So he's going to be a guy that we will cut this next offseason and then try to get his value down. We've done that with a lot of guys in the past. We did that with Carson before he got hurt. We did that with Dunlap. Um, and I think that he's a clear candidate for that to happen too. Colby Parkinson is pretty balanced all around. We haven't seen a ton of him, but definitely a good like tight end three to fall back on in case one of those guys gets injured or something. Um, but I do think, especially if Locke starts, that Fant is going to be seeing a good amount of offensive production. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I really like what we have going forward in terms of this unit. Yeah, I agree. That's a great way to wrap that up, by the way. It sounded very professional. Yeah. Um, <laughs> But I, I agree. Like I said that like six times. I like you have for every here. single one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's you've wrapped up every single one like an outro on a TikTok. <laughs> that's I'm no, trained. You are exactly. That's what it is. <laughs> but you can't be doing that on a podcast. You got to be more fluid, or the people yeah, will think yeah, you're I'm fake. Not conditioned enough. <laughs> you need to get more conditioned. Start your own podcast. The people want okay. it. I'm sure they do. No, I uh, need a JPL NFL podcast. <laughs> No, I, I agree. I think Fant, especially like you said with Locke, it'll be interesting to see how much he favors him because there's a little bit of connection there. Um, and his inconsistency, like you said, it's not quite on the level where you're going to fumble the ball three times. It's more or less just sometimes he's going to disappear. And I think that's a lot more stomachable than somebody who's just going to completely fumble the bag, literally. Um, so I, I'm really excited to see what he's going to be able to do. And then Disley, like I said, solid blocker. Parkinson, solid tight end three. It's... It's, it's a fun group. You got a great tight end group. You got a great receiver room. Offensive line is trending upward, and we can talk about the rest over here in a minute. Then you've got the backfield with, I'm telling you, I, I am really becoming a Rashad Penny hater. It's it's happening very slowly because I, I get the hype. He looked good in the last, what, five, six games of last year, but that's year four, and that's the first yeah. time he's shown, like, anything and there are people already putting him in their top 10 lists i've seen a couple he's top five next year i have one guy that is in my discord that preaches like anytime he brings up rashad penny he's like on rashad penny's nuts like crazy <laughs> and his argument is that derrick henry played bad for three years and then became very good so rashad penny can do the same thing that's like that's I, like the exact argument where all of these rookie quarterbacks will throw like a billion in interceptions and like, well, Peyton Manning did it. Exactly. Yeah, he's Peyton Manning. Exactly. Now. <laughs> they're they're fucking all time greats. Like I th I think we can call Henry an all time great at this point. I don't yeah, think that's over yeah. exaggerating. After the, like, like, these incredible are incredible. Yeah, these are all time greats at the position. They are the exception, not the norm. This is not how the position works. Like I get it. Penny has cool traits, but like. He's he's not very wiggly. He's a stiff running back that just kind of runs straight, and yet it's hard to bring him down. But people can still do it. I mean, you there's ways to bring those type of guys down. You need to have some sort of ability to move, ability to free yourself up, and Penny just doesn't have it. And his vision, like, it's fine. It's nothing special. He, he's just a big dude. And, like, eventually that's only going to get you so far because we've seen health concerns with Penny already. If you run the way he does consistently, 
without trying to shy away from contact in the slightest, you're going to continue to have those issues. So I just, I just don't see the vision with Penny being this elite top 10 running back like some people. I think even Theo Ash put him in his top 10. Yeah, he did. But that is <laughs> insane to me. Like, and maybe this is a little bit of bias. You're a pretty unbiased individual, so you can you can catch me if I'm wrong. But like people think he's better than guys like David Montgomery, and I just I don't get it. Like Montgomery's a consistent back. He has elite traits across the board. Like he's he's just not super fast, so he gets overlooked. That's that's my opinion on it. But like people put him over Monty, and I just don't get it. I really don't. He's not even the best running back on his football team right now. So okay. I used to be in the exact same boat that you are right now. Um, there was a point in like year two or maybe year – it was year two, yes. He was basically like splitting carries with Carson. Like he looked like a really incredible runner and then had a horrible ACL tear with like yeah. a bunch of collateral damage. Like screwed up his knee so bad and missed like almost all of the next year. Came back and looked really rough. Um, and then going into this last season in preseason, he was taking carries where I thought like, should he make the roster? Like he looked horrible, super unexplosive and just could not find open field. He mm -hmm. looked so bad. Um, and then he didn't really look great for the beginning of this year, uh, especially with how bad the passing game is, but even guys like DJ Dallas, um, Alex Collins, Travis Homer, all of those guys were finding, legit yardage in the run game because our scheme is so good um mm -hmm. but at one point we ended up signing adrian peterson yeah. to our team for like two games and he worked with penny a lot and since then penny just turned up like i i think that his traits are a little bit better than what you're giving him credit for i think maybe i need to go back and watch healthy. well but... okay to be fair like you're not watching a super healthy penny like, if right. you watch, like, year two Penny or, like, college Penny, that is, okay. like, what you can expect from him. He is much more, like, home run speed. Okay. Um, his vision is way better. Um, okay. And we saw that vision really come into play um, these last, like, few games of the season where he was crazy efficient, had yeah. over six yards of carry. Um, he looked incredible. And, like, ever since he worked with Adrian Peterson, he has been awesome. It looks like he's made strides in – getting more explosive since his injury. Um, but like you said, he's a very, very injury prone back. And I do not count on anything in terms of him staying healthy. Damn. Kenneth Walker is a really good crutch to lean on though. Like Kenneth Walker, yeah. if he was our running back one and we didn't have Penny, I would feel very comfortable. Yeah. Um, but Walker is a little unhealthy right now. He has a hernia and he's yeah. getting some procedure done for it. Um, but they're, I think like, he'll be trying to keep that hush hush, aren't they? Aren't they like saying it's not a big deal and trying to downplay it really hard? So it's kind of weird because apparently it's like a normal hernia rather than a sports hernia, right. which is better. And they're saying he'll be back by week one, but you can never ever trust Seattle talking about their own players' injuries. <laughs> like someone could get like decapitated, and in the post game press conference, Pete Carroll will be like. We sure hope he's back next week. Like you can never ever trust him in terms of yeah. how bad a player's injury looks. Um, but if it is, if they aren't lying and it is an actual hernia, it shouldn't be a major concern. If it is a sports hernia, he'll miss probably two weeks of the season. Yeah. But then after that, he'll be back. Um, and then DJ Dallas and Travis Homer are more likely than not going to be our other two running backs. And in the preseason. They've created yards, man. Like this scheme is so tailor made to everyone in this running back room. And I really do think that they will get some actual carries this season just because of like how run heavy we're going to be and how much we want to disperse the workload. I think they're going to get some a carry, some carries, and I think that they'll be pretty efficient with it. Um, this run scheme really favors them. And I think that we are going to have like a ton, a ton of rushing production. And those head guys like Penny and Kenneth Walker are going to be the main headline reason for that. Okay. Yeah, I agree. Uh, real quick as a side note, you're up in the fantasy draft. You have my permission on my podcast oh, to go pick. man. Okay. Um, <laughs> oh, by the way, I think Montgomery over Mixon was a crazy choice. Okay, listen. Let me put it this way. 
Number one, I suck at fantasy. Okay, I am okay. horrid. I am well. fully aware of that. I would rather lose with my guys than play well with somebody that I don't support in Joe Mixon. Like I, I don't I don't want to go full into it, but like we, we, we know what Mixon did. And I, I don't like backing those type of guys. And I know it's fantasy, and that's probably a goofy ass reason, but I don't care. I'm a goofy ass fellow when it comes to fantasy football. I, I do things my way. I was Fair legitimately enough. considering drafting only fullbacks for this league, but then I was like, no, well, yeah, I, I, I should take it. Too- like, you'd be quite the fraud here if you didn't yeah. take a fullback with your first right. round. Like, I, I, I wanted to be respectful because it's not my league. I'm not going to like throw it away and be that guy. But um, yeah, yeah I don't nice. care that taking Monty 11th overall in a 20-man league was a bad decision. It was my decision, <laughs> and I stand by it. Yeah, um, well, there you go. I went with I went with Acres, by the way. I saw that. Thank you for yeah. not taking my guy. Hopefully, he falls two more picks, and I'll uh, get I, Kyle I Pitts. wanted Pitts. I, yeah, I, that's, I did that's want. I was thinking for. about Pitts. Um, the good news is, is this episode probably will. But by the time you have drafted, this hopefully, will not be out. with so, how slow this yeah. league is going, maybe, maybe, maybe not. Hopefully, no one like steals this idea here and. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thanks, no. Man. I. I th- I, I like the depth in the running back room. I agree. DJ Dallas, Travis Homer, they're solid. Um, and maybe I do need I need to go back and watch Healthy Penny, I guess. But I'm just saying, from what I saw last year, we're talking, what, a five, six-game sample size? Yeah. And, and people are preaching the gospel like he's the second coming of Christ. Like, come on. Like, I, I get being excited. I get saying, oh, this guy's a breakout candidate. Oh, this guy's going to be good. But putting him as a top 10 or a top five running back over established guys who haven't like fallen off or suffered some major injury. Like, don't get me wrong. I'm talent over production all the way. I film does not lie. The tape does not lie. Numbers lie, but the tape does not. So if Penny was some psycho on the field for four games running around like prime Barry Sanders, maybe I would have a different tune. You know, maybe I'd be singing a different tune. But, like, I get the production, I get the efficiency, that matters. But I just didn't see anything that blew me away. Like, he he was good. He, that's, like, top top 15. I'll, I'll, I'll happily say he's a top 15 running back. But top 10 or top 5 is just insane to me. If he can replicate that yeah, this year and get us... <laughs> yeah, if he can replicate that this year and get a second contract, because we still don't know if, that, if he's even going to get that, then... Maybe I'll start warming up to the idea, but for now, people need to settle the fuck down. I, like I said, I am about to become a Rashad Penny hater. Uh, I'll throw him with DeAndre Swift and Antonio Gibson on running backs, whose downfall I'm preying on. Which, by the way, Gibson's paying off very well. Yeah, I, yeah. I, I love Brian Robinson. I'm so confident in him becoming their RB one. And yes. apparently, that happened today. I didn't get to watch the game, but I heard he took the carries and Gibson was returning kicks. Yeah, yeah, I know. Gibson has been practicing with like the special teams unit yeah. pretty much all of training camp. Like he is getting completely raised awesome. out of that offense. I, I don't think he's that good either. I don't think Gibson's yeah, that good. I don't, I don't think Swift's that good. I think Swift is extremely overhyped. I agree. Like, I agree. Like, he's a fantasy me, merchant. He's a fantasy merchant. And the way I look at him, my buddy, uh, the Geek Slays, I don't know if you've heard of him. He's been on my podcast a couple of times. He described him as Darren Sproles, but like four inches taller. And I ah, think that's the yeah. most accurate description I've ever heard because that's all he is. He can catch the ball. He's good at that, yeah. but he can't run. I, like I've gone as far to say I think Jamal Williams is a better running back than Swift. I, I would agree. I Like you look at Swift's – like this is a total perfect situation for Swift to thrive. Mm-hmm. You look at his efficiency numbers and it's just never been there. His vision is so trash. He's mm-hmm. just like not that good of a runner. And with how good of a situation this is for a running back, if he does not like succeed, succeed – I don't think he's a very good runner. Oh, he's got to break like 1,200 yards. There, oh, if yeah. he doesn't break 1,200 oh, yeah. yards, I, he, you're done. You, you got to yeah. give up. Uh-huh. Like like you said, his vision sucks. He can't break tackles. All he has to him is, is he's quick and he can catch the football. He is a scat back. He is a glorified <laughs> third down scat back. He is not a lead runner. He's not a number one guy. He's sure as fuck not a top 10 back. Which again, another guy I see thrown into the top ten all the time, and I think it's insane. Like, and maybe I'm overrating him a little bit because he's my boy, but David Montgomery is being disrespected when you put guys like Penny and Gibson and Swift above him in your running back rankings. 
Because Monty can actually do work. Like, yeah, he missed four games last year and had, what, like 870 yards behind the worst offensive line in football. I don't care that his yards per carry were low. I don't care that his efficiency was low. It's because he's running behind middle schoolers out there. It, that, that's the NFL today. If you're a running back and you don't have a good offensive line, you're not going to play well. Yet he's still managing to put up decent sat, decent stats. And he's a top 10 receiving back in the NFL. He can catch the ball at a high level. He's a good route runner. He's got great hands. He can make guys miss. David Montgomery's just not fast. That That's his downfall. And even then, it's not like he's a snail back there. He just doesn't have the home run speed a guy like, uh, you know, Jonathan Taylor would have. I'm sorry. I, I just had to get that out. David oh, Montgomery no, no, deserves more goddamn respect. <laughs> I hate it. Like, I made my top 10 running backs list on TikTok, and I put him at 10, and people were losing their minds Lost over their mind, it. Yeah. Like, come on now. That's ridiculous. It's absolutely ridiculous. Am I being crazy here? Like, I trust well, you to tell me, am I being crazy here? I am. I'm a little lower on him than you are, but I have right. watched like, like next to zero of him. So okay. I think my opinion on Monty is pretty invalid. I need Fair to watch him a little for before, before I like okay. have a definitive opinion. Okay. Well, if you get around to watching him, come back to me and let me know if I'm being absolutely we'll do. crazy. We'll do. Because I, a couple of the people I've spoken to that aren't Bears fans, hell, a couple of them are even Packers fans have, have vouched for him. So I, okay. but I don't know. I could still be a little bit biased. I try not to be, but Monty might be my exception unintentionally. Okay. Um, That's fair enough. Fair enough. Yeah. But back to the Seahawks. I, that that's just the theme of this of every podcast I do. I get off topic. It's my fault. It's fine. Um, we talked about the tackles. You got to talk about the interior of this line because I. I don't know what to think of it. It's it's okay, I guess is the best way to put it. I think that's generous. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I don't know. I don't know how I feel about this. Like Gabe Jackson is good. He's probably our only like good offensive lineman right now, but yeah. he is old, like an aging veteran, and mm-hmm. his clock is very much ticking right now. Like he, mm-hmm. like on tape, it's very clear that he has lost a step in athleticism, and. Uh, I think that his time is running out, but, yeah. um, I don't know, man. Starting two rookie tackles is rarely a smart thing to do. If you want your offensive line to be good now, yeah. like these guys project really well for the future. And I guess Charles cross is probably the safest tackle in this class. I, was, but, I feel like he's polished enough to where you can feel good about it, but he's yeah, still a rookie. Yeah, cross, right. cross is less of my concern. Um, the right yeah. tackle, Abe Lucas is. He's looked good in preseason, but on tape, I think he's been kind of sloppy, like, like yeah. college tape, that is. Um, and th- Austin Blythe is a okay center, like you said. He's very okay. Um, I he, he fits well with the scheme because he yeah. was the Rams center when Waldron was there, um, and mm-hmm. I think this was kind of just Waldron going out and getting his guy. He'll be a good run blocker for us, but he's a little bit undersized. Um, he's and a liability in pass protection. Yeah. Yeah. And that's like, that is how we operate with centers. Like our yeah. last center was a carbon copy in terms of play style, Ethan Pochich. And I was going to say, I can't a name a single center you guys have had since was it Max Garcia. Unger. Was that his Unger. Unger. Unger, Unger, not Unger Garcia. Yeah. Close. Max Garcia <laughs> was somebody, but yeah, Unger, that was the guy you guys got for, or traded away for Jimmy, Jimmy Graham. Graham right? Jimmy Graham yeah. trade. Yes. God, that was a decade ago. Oh, yeah, man. Ew. That's crazy. <laughs> ew. Sorry. I'm I'm going to No, you're good. Um, the the only other the only other one that we haven't touched on is Damian Lewis and he was the guy that got put into an air cast and got like carted off. So his X-rays yeah, came back negative. I was going to we'll say see. he dodged a bullet. Yeah. Oh, my, I thought he I thought he had like an Allen Hearn Allen Hearns. The dude from yeah. the Cowboys who like broke his ankle. Yeah. Yeah. Um I thought he had an injury on that scale. Um, but it looks like it's just a really, really high grade ankle sprain. Mm-hmm. Um, so we'll see when he's back, but he was a guy that looked to be like a total rookie steal out of the third round, had a really good rookie season and then hasn't really improved that much since then. Um, so he'll be a solid interior guard, but I'm not expecting any kind of like major season out of him. Yeah, I, I agree across the board, honestly. Like Gabe Jackson, like you said, he's solid, but he has lost a step. He's just not there athletically. Um, he's got a really good anchor, but I'm worried about how he's going to fit in this run scheme because it's going to be a lot of offensive linemen getting up and moving and getting out there, and I don't know how he's going to fit with that. 
Uh, Blythe, like you said, undersized guy, but he's good run blocker. But in pass pro, he sucks. Like he he hasn't played football in two years, uh, which is crazy. But the last three seasons he played from 2018 to 2020, he had he let up 36 pressures in 2018, 38 in 2019, and 31 in 2020. Like he is a complete liability as a pass protector because he's small. He gets completely overwhelmed by anyone with any sort of power. And at center, that's all you're going up against. So he's going to get bodied consistently at center. And then Damian Lewis, like you said, he, he's a hell of a run blocker. Uh, he's super athletic, but he's he's really not a good pass protector. He just feels, or he just looks like he feels a lot more comfortable going forward than backward uh, as a guard, which I mean, I understand, uh, but you you want to see more out of him as a pass protector but as a run blocker he fits the scheme perfectly he can move he can drive people he can pop somebody downfield like he's gonna be fun to watch when he's back on the field as a run blocker but somebody you didn't mention that i like a good bit is phil haynes uh one of the depth interior linemen and i think he's somebody maybe you can try him at center i don't know if he's ever played center before but if blythe doesn't work out you can pop him in there i think he'd do work He's seen very limited snaps on the field. I think his first start was in a playoff game against Green Bay, and he held his own. He looked really good in that game. Um, and then he looked good in a handful of starts for you guys last year. It's it's just kind of waiting for him to find a place to get an opportunity, and once he gets that opportunity, I think he'll absolutely take over. Yeah, yeah. Haynes has had a really good training camp, and in interviews, Pete Carroll swears that we have, like, three starting caliber guards because Haynes has just been awesome and I would not be surprised like he'll he'll fill in fine for uh Damian Lewis I'm not too worried yeah. about him filling in there but uh yeah maybe we'll try him out at center I wouldn't be surprised yeah once Lewis comes back because Lewis should miss you said it uh, looks like a high grade ankle sprain yeah it'll be a couple weeks he won't be ready for week one right. maybe two or three weeks but right. yeah we'll see okay um, unless there was anybody we skipped over on offense, which I don't think we did. I think we can go ahead and move over to the defense. Yeah, I think we're good. All right. This defense, like I said already, is interesting. I'm excited to see what it's going to be able to do because I think they have one of the worst pass rushes over the past couple of years. It's changed now. It's not there anymore. They have upside. They have a plan. But you still want to see those guys kind of step up and develop into the role and, and find themselves a place. And you're losing, I think it was – little bit under 2,000 total snaps by losing Carlos Dunlap, Benson Maioa, and Rashid Green. Um, so that's a lot of production, a lot of uh, high snap count you're going to be missing out on. But you do have Daryl Taylor, who's going to be getting more opportunities. You have the rookies. You have Uchenna Nwosu. So just starting out with the edge rushers, how do you feel about this group? I really like this edge uh, group. I think other than wide receiver, this is probably our deepest unit. Um, Daryl Taylor had, I think, six and a half sacks on the last mm -hmm. year and looks to be like a total, total breakout candidate. Um, I'm expecting really good things and has been completely unblockable in camp. Uh, I think Daryl Taylor is going to be one of the better edges in football by the end of the year. Uchenna and Wosu is super, super explosive, um, very high level speed. And going on the other side of Daryl Taylor, those are very hard to block. I would love mm -hmm. to see a lot of like, fire zone five man rushes out of this unit because that's just super hard to hold off for a long duration of time. Mm -hmm. Um if you're going one on one like and Wosu is beating you off the edge most likely. It's it's very hard to find a tackle who is quick enough to keep up with him. Um and then we've talked about guys like Mafe and Tyreek Smith. Mm -hmm. Uh both fast and both probably nothing more than rotational guys. Um, but in terms of just the edges, I love it. You mentioned those guys that were missing. Um, it was who was it? it was uh, Benson Mayo, Green, oh, Carlos yeah. Dunlop, and Benson Mayo. That was the other one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Benson Mayo. Um, yeah, those were. They would not make the team right now if they were still trying out for camp because they're just a total four-three scheme, yeah. like defensive end. And now that we're pivoting towards three-four speedy linebackers off the edge, yeah. they just don't have a role in the defense. So, mm -hmm. and, and none of them were really that incredible anyways. Mayoa and Dunlap were especially disappointing. And then Rasheem green was like a really good rotational piece, but not quite starting quality. Um, yeah. so yeah, well, like I'm not too concerned about those, the loss no, of any of those three. I'm not concerned about it either. 
I just want to bring it up because I think the key here is the opportunities that Daryl Taylor is going to be able to get. That was kind of where I was going with that. I, yeah, I should have yeah, uh, communicated better. Yeah, because I mean, I was going back and looking at some of his uh, draft reports because I wasn't really following him out of college. And he was somebody that a lot of people weren't very high on. He wasn't super strong. He wasn't super quick, but he had a big frame. And the Seahawks took a chance on him. He didn't play in 2020, his rookie year. He dropped 10 pounds and came out, looked like a completely different football player. He is so explosive. He's incredible off the edge. Um, he There's a lot of flashes there. He hasn't quite pulled together the consistency, but I mean, if I mean, you're banking on upside here, and I think he's going to be incredible. Like you said, big time breakout candidate. He wins with a really dominant spin move. He's got great get off. His bend is really impressive. Um, he was he had a lot of dominant wins last year that like changed games. He was a legitimate game changer at times last year. It's just you want to see him be a little bit more consistent. And I personally would like to see him add a little bit of power to his game because we see guys like yeah, Brian Burns, who's all speed. But there are even times where you can take Brian Burns out of the game if you can get your hands on him, which with him, easier said than done. But Daryl Taylor isn't quite the athlete he is. So I think if you add that power to his game, which I mean, that's just hitting the weight room a little bit. Um, you you can become a more versatile, more reliable, more impactful defensive end because you're going to be able to get to the quarterback a lot easier. You're not going to have to specifically rely on that speed. You can power through a guy or two. And uh, I think with more opportunities this year, relying on him to be, I would say, the number one edge on this team, um, that's kind of the expectation. I, I don't have any worries about him whatsoever. Although I will say, I think there is a world where maybe he doesn't quite hit the ceiling. You and I are both expecting him to hit. But even then, he becomes a really damn good rotational defensive end, or I guess uh, outside linebacker in a 3-4. So I, I really like him. And then like you said with Nwosu, he's familiar with this type of defense coming over from Brandon Staley in LA. Um, he's really, really quick, really, really explosive. He's great as you're like Robin to uh, uh, Daryl Taylor's Batman. Um He's a really capable run defender as well. Like he, he's he's great. I think you guys are doing great there. And then we talked about the rookies. So I, I think it's a really good edge group. I agree completely. I think it's deep. I think it's solid. And I think behind the wide receivers, it's probably the best group. I feel very like I like I've said so many times. I feel very good about this unit going forward. You feel very good about a lot of units on this yeah, team. Yeah, hey, 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 we're promising. With, you're pro right, but I don't think I, I've ever met a Seahawks fan that feels this good about so many units on this team. Uh, yeah. With how bad it's going to be this year. <laughs> and that is your catchphrase. <laughs> Put that in your goddamn TikTok bio. bio. I feel, yeah, I feel very I feel good, good about, about this unit, unit going, going forward. forward. <laughs> um, so another unit, the interior defensive line. How do you do? You feel good about this unit going forward as well. Uh, not as much. Um, it's, Aww. well, <laughs> I don't feel bad, but, okay. but this is not going to be okay about this unit. Moving yeah, forward. That, that's a good way to put it. Yeah. Okay. Um, th this unit is not going to be any kind of star power, big time pass. Like we're just going to be kind of run stoppers here. All of the yeah. pass rush is going to be coming off the edge. Um, you've got three big bodies on the inside. Puna Ford, Al Woods, Shelby Harris, and then Quentin Jefferson and LJ Collier, assuming he makes the team, should be seeing some pretty solid rotational time. Uh, but I think that this is going to kind of be centered around power rushing and run stopping. I don't think that this is going to be a major quarterback pressure group. Kind of just plug up the interior and yeah. let the guys off the edge fly. Yeah, there's a lot of space um, eaters here. Yeah, yeah. So, so not like not the sexiest group, but you know, like they'll be pretty important to the run stopping side, run stuffing side of things. Yeah, I, I might be a little bit higher on this uh, interior defensive line than really? you are. Because first of all, I am enamored with Puna Ford. I, I talked yeah, about him a little enough. bit the last time we talked about him. Like it, this man should not be able to do what he can do. I, I can't remember. He's what, like 5'11", 300 pounds or something bonkers I, I, like that. Five eleven. I think he's shorter than five eleven. Right, right. Right now, he's he, his body type does not make sense, but he's quick in a way. He's like he's got quickness to him. 
but his strength is insane. Like he's very explosive. That's the word I'm looking for. He's an explosive pass rusher or not pass rusher, explosive defensive lineman at that size. And he can really, really use that to his advantage in terms of leverage, his height. He can get up underneath the guys and get low one guys. Um, and he can even play nose tackle if you need him to, uh, on top of being a really dominant defensive okay. tackle. Yeah. And, you know, you have Al Woods, you can bring him in on obvious rundowns. But, like, if you need a guy to just stuff up the middle on later downs, like second and seven, uh, where it's not necessarily a guaranteed run or, you know, third and long, he can really plug up the defensive line. And then you're bringing over Shelby Harris, who I think the best word to describe him is tenacious. He's a really strong guy. He, another guy who's really good at coming in with leverage. He's really hard to block one-on-one. -on -one. And he's he's very similar to Puna Ford. He's just a little bit skinnier. Um, but he's gonna be he's gonna be able to move guys all over the place as your three tech. He comes in low, fast, and really hot. Uh, so I'm really excited to see what he's gonna be able to do here. And then Al Woods, I'm a sucker for a good nose tackle. I just love it when big boys get in there and do work. Um, he's what 35 years old, I think. Yeah, something like Somewhere that. He's there. very old. But and, he yeah. balled the fuck out last year as a 34 yeah. year old. Yeah, he is. He is big time for yeah us. he's you he just can't move him he's just one of those uh, guys you physically can't move um yeah. and then lj collier who you brought up he, he's an interesting player uh, i think mm -hmm. he's pretty much a bust at this point but oh gosh yeah maybe, that, was, that was that was an example of like i was talking earlier seattle does not always go with the conventional pick that is an yeah. example of that and like the typical result with yeah. that I will say, though, I'm interested to see what he's going to look like as a three-tech and a three-four, just because I feel like his role is a lot simpler. So maybe he can take advantage of that. You know, it's Pete Carroll loves guys who just scratch, claw, and fight their way to the top. So maybe he's the underdog in the defensive line room, and Pete Carroll takes a liking to him or something. But I wouldn't be shocked, like you said, to see him not make the team because he's just getting drowned out by the guys at the top. Because those three defensive linemen, Al Wood, Shelby Harris, and Puna Ford, they are you know, you don't have that stud that stands out, but collectively they might be one of the best run stuffing, run stuffing interior defensive lines in football. Would you say you feel good about this unit going forward? I feel fantastic about this unit <laughs> going forward. Maybe not long-term because Al Woods is up there in age, but, but yeah. going forward this season, I feel fantastic about them. Mm -hmm. That's good. That's good. Yeah. Um. So moving on from there. Got the linebacker room. How do you feel about this unit moving forward? All right. Um, uh, all right. Yeah. Uh, are, are we considering the edges as linebackers? No, just the off-ball guys. So Jordan yeah. Brooks, Cody Barton, Ben Burkirvin, Tanner Muse, uh, Joel uh, Igunyway, even though he just got cut. I just want to bring that yeah. up. Yeah, he Seahawks won't be that. playing much. Uh, Get my boy dirty. Yeah, no, he had that goal line stop against us. He played he good. Did. And then he, he got did, cut. Man. Yeah. But Ben Burke Irvin has a job. Like yeah, well, he's on the like injury list, I think, right now. Because I don't think you he's taking him off of him, throw him on the street. Fuck get, Ben Burke Irvin. Yeah, make him get him out of that clubhouse. Yeah. Um, but Jordan Brooks is going to play a very, very crucial role in this defense. One of the biggest concerns on defense through our two preseason games so far is that we just cannot tackle. Mm -hmm. and, like we have been so horrible at it and Jordan Brooks pretty sure he led the league in tackles last year but if not he was like two or three he set a franchise record um granted that was with the 17 game season but still, still like crazy like, considering Bobby Wagner yeah. played for this team for a decade exactly and like this dude is going into his third season like he is going to be so so crucial for us and um Cody Barton is a former third rounder that has never mm -hmm. really seen the field a ton. Um, but athletically he is much better than Wagner was last season and should be pretty solid in the off ball scope of things. Jordan Brooks is no coverage linebacker by any means. We're going to get torched over the middle. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, uh, Barton should help clean things up in that sense a little bit. But, like, I legitimately think Jordan Brooks is the most, maybe not the best, but he's the most important player to this defense um, because, like, tackling is very clearly an issue, and he might be one of, if not the league's best tackler if we're going off of just tackles. I was going to say, you can't go off of just tackles because I yeah, may, maybe yeah. you feel a little bit differently than me here, but I think tackles are the most overrated statistic in the entire Probably league. Probably true. 
like, but ten- like regardless, he's he's a good. No, tackler. he's a good you, he's a good run yeah. defender. Yeah, he's a good tackler. But when it comes to tackles, they count shit like shoving somebody out of bounds and fall or like downing yeah. a receiver who hit the ground. They count that shit as tackles. Like Blake Martinez led the league in tackles for three years. Blake Martinez is not a good linebacker. He's just <laughs> always in the right place at the right time. He's very opportunistic. Um, so. I, I mean, I'm not disagreeing with you. It shows up on tape. He's a good tackler, but uh, let, let's not get carried away with the with the tackle numbers. I, I think the thing with Jordan Brooks is you're just trying to figure out whether or not he's a thumper or if he's an actual linebacker that can do a little bit more. Because I hate to say it, but the league's trending away from thumpers as much as I love them. I, I love, like, they're, 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 they're the fullbacks of the defense. A linebacker that can just thump somebody in the run, they are the fullback of the defense. And they're just not quite there anymore. So Jordan Brooks being, like you said, a liability in coverage is concerning. Um, It's just, he he doesn't have that natural feel that you want a linebacker to have. It feels like, Uh, but he's kind of, he's getting there. He's learning a little bit. He's getting a little bit better every year. So uh, maybe, maybe he'll take a big leap with Bobby Wagner being gone. Uh, but he's a real physical dude. He's a good tackler, but I'd like to see him be a little bit more disciplined with his tackles because he takes some wonky angles at times and he misses a decent yeah. bit of tackles. But, you know, like I said, Bobby Wagner was there, so he could just kind of fly all over the field and do whatever the fuck he wanted. And Bobby Wagner would teleport behind him if he missed. So <laughs> he doesn't quite have that to rely on anymore, so maybe he will become a little bit more disciplined. And as for Cody Barton, I, I kind of like him a little bit more than Brooks. I like his length. Um, I think he definitely has more potential as a coverage backer than Brooks. Um, and he's, he's pretty, pretty okay against the run as well. And he's played well in the, the few opportunities he's had. So I'm excited to see what he's able to do. Uh, ben Burke Irvin, like you said, he's on the injured list or some shit, but he doesn't fit this defense at all. He's a textbook undersized weak side linebacker and a 4-3, and that role just doesn't exist in a 3-4, so there's no place for him here. he will not be making the team. No. And then there's Tanner Muse, who's a little bit interesting. He's a converted safety, didn't quite make it with the Raiders. I think he actually got cut after the draft, if I'm not mistaken. And then you guys scooped him up. So maybe there's something there. Uh, Also, fuck the Seahawks for cutting Joel Igbuni away. Pisses me (laughs) off. He deserved a spot. He, He made the goal line stop against Chicago. The one good play... That your team made, period. Those did not come come often. <laughs> yeah, and he got cut. Yeah, man. It, was, it pisses me off. He's a yeah. good special teamer, too. Um, he is. Yeah. I don't know. Am I missing anybody in this linebacker room? I think I think that's everybody relevant. Unless I'm... I think John Radigan might be nice. I don't know how okay. much time he's going to get, but he looked promising uh, when he was on the field. Undrafted rookie free agent. Um, he's an army I guy. Think. Yeah, yeah, man. Oh, but he's on yeah, the pup Radigan. list. Oh, yeah, that's true. But if he does see the field, he'll look all right. Like he's he's got some room to grow for sure. But uh, I think he'll be a significant part to this linebacker room if one of those yeah. guys gets hurt. We've also got Lakeem Williams, Joel DeBlanco, and Vi Jones. Are they anybody? Oh, Vi Jones. Vi Jones might make the team. Um, okay. I don't think those other two will. But well, an insta- Vi, Vi insta- Jones might. Guy. Okay. Yeah. Uh, th- I feel very out of the loop right here. Cause I, I do not know anything about any of these guys. Yeah. Well, I mean, I'm not incredibly in tune with our preseason linebacker depth right now. So you should be what kind of fan. Yeah. Are you, you don't I'm know a the casual. Yeah. I guess <laughs> not every team has the benefit of linebacker. Not every team has the benefit of getting a UDFA Jack Sanborn to come in and be preseason defensive player of the week, week one. True. That's true. Dude's a dog. I, I just want to take a victory lap real quick. I called Sam Bourne ahead of time. I had the Bears taking him in the fifth round in my mock drafts. We picked him up as a UDFA, and he's been balling the fuck out. <laughs> so when he's a good linebacker, when he's the Bears starting strong side linebacker by the end of the year, that that's my win. That's my Drew Lock equivalent. If Drew Lock pans out for you, I'll be the yeah, same way about go. the UDFA yeah. out of Wisco that I only knew about because I was obsessed with Leo Chanel and could not stop watching Leo Chanel. <laughs> God, he's, did, did you see him today against the commanders, by the way, just off topic? I did not. I did. I, I wasn't able to watch any of the games today. Actually. I didn't get I'll to watch, watch any of the game, them, but I didn't get to watch a lot of the game, but I saw a lot of uh, Leo Chanel popping up on my timeline and he looked good. 
Eddie. Shell's yeah. gonna be. He's, um, I know he's gonna be a demon. linebacker one. I think he was my LB too. Really? Okay. Yeah, Theo. I mean, that's Theo praising him made me go watch him, and I was like, oh, okay, because okay. he was like, he's You're like, like six two. Here. Yeah, he's like six two, six three, two fifty. Ran a four five. He's a thumper, but he's also capable as a coverage linebacker. Like I, I like him a lot. He, he's. I don't know. I was a big fan of him. And I only had him as my LB2 because I didn't like uh, what's his name? Devin Lloyd. I wasn't very high on Devin Lloyd. Oh, really? I loved Lloyd. I don't like I linebackers that can't tackle. Yeah, that's fair. I just thought he had a really great like knack for the ball. Yeah, and I I get that. And he he deserves his roses for it. But a linebacker's got to be able to tackle. Yeah, and that's fair. Definitely like, a fair criticism. Yeah, like he... I think it's him. It's either him or Brian Osamoa that does this, but they like stop right before they make the tackle and lunge head first into the person. Like they come to it a complete him. stop. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Like you can't get, that's how you break your fucking neck. Yeah. Why? Like literally, I, I don't mean to sound insensitive here, but linebacker coaches got to be like, Hey, have you ever heard of Ryan Shazier? Don't do that. Like how yeah. did a coach in college not stop him from doing that? What, a- what, what is that? And like, once you get to the NFL at that point, I feel like it's almost too late. Like, that's yeah. why I have issues yeah, like, with Brian yeah. Osamoa as well, because he can't... T- Brian Osamoa tries to put you in a headlock to tackle you, and that's not yeah. going to work when he's going up against real running backs. Like, imagine trying to put Derrick Henry in a headlock. Derrick Henry in a head- just, like, getting, like, he's gonna get, shanked up the field. Uh, he's going to get carried on his back. He's going to get a piggyback ride to the end zone if he tries that yeah. shit. I don't know. I I didn't like this linebacker class a whole lot outside of Dean and Chanel, just because these guys Dean couldn't fell. fucking tackle. Dean fell because of the shoulder thing. Yeah, I don't know. Which That's he shouldn't have. Me to take him in the third round. I would have. I had him mocked in the first round in every single mock. Yeah, I did. He's the only like linebacker I, I had going in the first. Yeah, he was. He's I think good. Dean's going to be incredible. They've got him next to Kaiser White after having no linebackers last year. Mm-hmm. Like that. That you want to talk about a glow up? That Philadelphia linebacker room is going to be insane oh this year. Yeah, I'm very high on Philly. Oh, I am too. I keep. Yeah. I keep going back and forth with my record prediction though. Cause part of me feels like they're going to kind of, they're going to win their division, but they're only going to win like 10 games and they're just going to pop off in the playoffs. Like, I feel like that's what they're destined to do. They're going to upset somebody early on in the playoffs and then people are going to be like, Oh shit. And then I don't they're know, legit. probably the NFC championship game. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. They, but I, I love Jalen hurts. I'm a big hurts guy. And I think hurts is going to be, like their franchise guy, I think hurts. Yeah, is awesome. I, I agree. I'm 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 high on hurts. Okay, I, I'm just stalling. Oh lord, I'm just stalling because I don't want to talk about Seattle secondary. Yeah, There's like uh, for good reason. <laughs> yeah, like the, it's not going to be incredible. <laughs> just starting with the corners. How about how do you feel about this unit going forward? Uh, poor, very poor. Yeah, outside of Woolen and Bryant, since we already talked yeah, about them, the well, others. That, they, I don't know how big of an impact they're going to be making this year. Right. Um, right now, like the only guy that we have that is guaranteed time is Sidney Jones. And he is by no means a cornerback one. No, he's like a low end two, high end three. Like yeah, he's... exactly. Like, yeah, he is, he's very mid. Yeah. Um, For lack of better words. Yeah, he's mid. Yeah. Um, we are getting a guy back, Trey Brown, who was our fourth rounder last year, who definitely showed a lot of promise. But he only played mm-hmm. like like five games. Um, the only real knock on him is his size. He's like five eight. Yeah, he's, he's tiny. very small. Um, but if he comes back and plays anything like he did last year, we've definitely got a solid cornerback in him. I think he could be seeing a lot of nickel time, um, okay. just based on his size. Um, Kobe Bryant, I I was thinking would get some time, but I'm not so sure now. Uh, and then it's like Artie Burns and Justin Coleman. Uh, I, I want to say real quick, I know the last time we talked, I wasn't very high on Artie Burns. I went back and watched the couple games that he played in Chicago. It, uh, so it's it's a it's a very limited sample size. But he yeah. didn't look half bad. He okay. looked okay. Uh, there, there were some moments where I was like, okay, you know, like th- there's something there. He's a solid okay. depth yeah, corner, yeah. but you know, he's like 27 or some shit. Hasn't played a full season yet in his career. Former first round pick. Like he's not going to be anything, but it could be solid depth. Yeah. For such a low caliber name, there's some very polarized opinions about him. Like his PFF grade <laughs> is almost 90. And then what the fuck? It, it was, I think it was 87 last year. 
Yeah, Maybe it it's because he only played in like four games. Point. Yeah, yeah, but Oof. but like, yeah, I don't know. And then I've seen some people say like he is the worst cornerback to ever touch a football field. No, he's so, not that. Kendall Vildor exists. So well, yeah. There's also Trey Flowers. <laughs> Trey Flowers. Oh, good man. God, he was awful last year. Oh, he was so bad. I forgot he existed. I didn't even know he played last year. Yeah, he's a Bengal. He like he got slandered so much on Twitter to the point where he demanded a release and then signed with the Bengals and was like their third stringer. His thought process there is like, okay, I'm going to go play behind Eli Apple and maybe they won't notice. Yeah, behind like, a real cornerback. <laughs> a real corner, yeah. Doesn't PFF love him too? Apple or Flowers? Apple. I don't know. I can look it up right now, but I remember seeing a video a while PFF back period. on TikTok where somebody was like, Eli Apple's not actually that bad. And I think they were, it was either their PFF grade or he brought up some random stat to try to back this narrative. No, he is, he is a 60.9. Okay. So it wasn't PFF. PFF. It was some random stat it that doesn't matter. I think it was PF, but it wasn't his just over. It was like just his like man coverage grade or okay. something like that. Maybe that's it. I mean, I didn't. But, but I don't. I don't have any PFF because it, it was somebody. I don't either. I I had to get somebody to send me PFF's fullback grades one time, and they ranked like four fullbacks, and I got pissed off. <laughs> like <laughs> because they got like a minimum snap count or something. So it's like oh, okay. it's like use check Ricard Reggie Gilliam and Alec Ingold were the only fullback and Jakob Johnson. Those are the fullbacks with grades, and use check was like fourth. So oh, that, I got yeah, pissed off. Yeah, no, it's it's wrong. It's not not good. It's wrong. Yeah. Uh, that's, but, pretty, that's another reason to not listen to PFF. Yeah, they don't know fullbacks. You heard it here first. They don't know football. Yeah, they don't know football do. at all. Yeah, but They especially don't know fullbacks. Mm -mm. That's yeah, like, go. just to avoid talking about their secondary a little bit more, that's <laughs> like the one thing PFF gets praised for almost universally is their offensive line grades. Mm -hmm. And I feel like 99% of that is just because, like you said earlier, everybody's too lazy to sit down and watch offensive line tape. And yeah, they're like the they're only doing. resource. Right. Yeah. Cause there's no stat you can go off of, you know, like mm -hmm. you can look at like sacks allowed or pressures allowed, but like penalties. Oh, yeah. Right. But there's not like a, a counting stat for offensive linemen and people aren't watching the, the tape on offensive linemen very often. Yeah. So PFF gets praised by default. I, I I really want to just one day go through and go hard on some offensive line tape and just try to expose them as frauds like Theo did with the Trevor Penning thing. Yeah. Yeah. Like I, I would love to do that for somebody. Cause that, I, I don't, I'm not one of those people that like Dick rides Theo. Like I, I think he's very wishy-washy at times. I, I shouldn't talk too much. Should I have him on my podcast one time, but like this, for example, the whole Devin Hester thing he's doing right now, I can't fucking stand. It is the dumbest narrative. I think I've ever seen anyone try to push. And like, I, I actually, not, I buy it. Like, are you talking about the like anti kick returner? The anti Devin Hester Hall of Fame because he was a receiver thing. Yeah, I don't, I don't know how I feel about that. I, I think I kind of lead towards no, but in terms of like, he will get in for sure because like, I, I feel like the standards for Hall of Fame has dropped and he is more than good enough at what he did to be a hall of famer. He's the I greatest just, player to ever do something. He belongs in the hall of fame for it. Yeah. But like, like his whole thing on like, like Tyreek Hill probably would be the greatest. Okay. But no, ever that's probably, there's no guarantee. That's a hypothetical. You can't keep him out based off hypotheticals. That's uh, ridiculous. Yeah, I guess that's fair. I guess like, that's fair. I'm very anti hypothetical with this kind of stuff. Like for example, I'm, I'm very pro old NFL players, like twenties, thirties, forties. And the argument against them is like, well, if you took a third string running back today and put them back then, they'd try them for witchcraft or something. Yeah. Like, yeah, but we're never going to know. So what's yeah. the point in arguing it? Like, yeah. if, if you don't have basis for it, what's the point? I hate hypotheticals and arguments unless we're doing something like hypothetically speaking at this play, like, you know, for fun. But like a yeah, legitimate yeah, yeah. narrative or argument, you can't use hypotheticals. Okay. Okay. Like, yeah, fair, enough. fair enough. Maybe Tyreek would have been better, but we don't know. And we'll never know. So why bring it up? Devin, from what we know, from what we've seen, he's the greatest player to ever return punts and arguably the greatest player to ever be a returner, period. Okay. So why do we argue it? There's no point. That's, 
that's that's yeah. definitely fair. I, can I can't. That. I can't remember what I was going to bring up originally. I think I was just going to bring up how funny the Trevor Penning thing was. Yeah. Like I, I didn't want to just because I brought him up so many times. I didn't want to seem like a little fanboy because I'm not. But uh, the Trevor Penning thing was objectively hilarious. Like he, oh, yeah. he dunked on them so hard. <laughs> but I I agree with the corner room here. Like Trey Brown, he looked. He looked okay at the end of the year last year. And if you go back and watch his senior bowl, he looked awesome. It was so like, I went back. I can't remember when I did, but it was a lot of fun to watch. He made a lot of big plays and he's got good ball skills. And back in Oklahoma, he was in this kind of uh, quarter quarters defense that decides going to be running with the secondary. So maybe, maybe that'll help him out. And he can kind of play like a Darius Williams or Darius. Yeah. Darius Williams type role where it's a undersized guy that can just kind of get to the ball and make plays. And then Artie Burns, like I said, he's whatever. And then there's Justin Coleman, who you just know Pete Carroll's going to vie for or like push for, but he's not good. And he hasn't been in a couple years now. So it's kind of yeah. pointless. Yeah. He was really legit at one point for in like 2017. Or yeah. Something like that. He was, but, but yeah, he's not and anymore. Then he fell off. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, but I. You know, speaking of slot guys, because that's kind of what Justin Reed is, I, or Justin Coleman, sorry, I really like John Reed, who's like a super athlete and could be a really explosive slot corner for you guys. And then obviously yeah. Sidney Jones, like I said, is just kind of a bucket of mid. Yeah. And then, oh, actually, one guy I forgot to talk about, um, Michael Jackson. Interesting name. But uh, we got Michael Jackson, we got Kobe Bryant in the same cornerback room. But, um, He's been starting at right cornerback basically all preseason, and he has, yeah, he's looked pretty good actually. Like he's done a really good job of breaking up plays. He's had some really clutch tackles because God knows that those are a rarity with this defense. Um, but yeah, I, I bet he makes the team, and I wouldn't be surprised if he's like a legit depth piece for us. Okay, I, I don't know anything about him, but I'll take your word for it. I believe it. I um, didn't know he was until the preseason. He just he started yeah. playing in the preseason. It's like oh, okay, this guy looks good. Okay. Uh, and then, then we get to the safety room, which I'm sure you feel a little bit better about because we've got Quandre Diggs, who I recently praised on TikTok with my uh, my safety that. list. Yeah. I probably would. I mean, I had him in consideration, but I probably right. wouldn't have went back and double checked on my homework before you said something. Yeah. Like I had to go back and watch a little bit and I was like, okay, I, I see the vision here. Yeah. Yeah. He's a, he's a legit, legit ball hawk. Um, mm -hmm. some, of the, some of the issue is because like, Obviously, we've talked about how Carroll just wants to run the Legion of Boom style mm -hmm. defense. He wanted him to be Earl Thomas, and that's just not who he is. No. Um, because because Earl Thomas, like, he was probably the most important player to that Legion of Boom because he could just cover the entire field as the only high safety on mm -hmm. the field. Like, and, and Quandre just can't do that. But, like, he made some legit plays on the ball. He's been our interception leader the past couple years. Um, he's, he's awesome. And if plugged into the right role, he'll be a legit, legit safety. Um, Jamal Adams is the big question mark. Uh -huh. Um, Absolutely. and yeah, he, he is a box safety like at heart. And there were times where we would just try to abandon what we did, go to high safeties and he would just get picked apart. Mm -hmm. Like that coverage is just not what he's supposed to do. I want to kind of play him as like a glorified linebacker. And I hope that that's what Desai and Clint Hurt end up doing. But we'll see. Um, I think if plugged into the right role, you can be really innovative with him and he can look really mm -hmm. good. Because there was a time where people considered him the best safety in the league. And yeah, I, like until that gets figured out, don't expect much from Jamal. But if, if we carve out the right role for him, he will be very good. Uh, in terms of the depth, Oh, what is that? Guy? Ryan Neal. Uh, he is, okay. he's kind of baby Quandre um, and he'll fill in pretty well in case Quandre gets hurt, but won't be seeing any significant time other than that. Um, and yeah, that's all I have to say about the safety room. Not a lot of guys I need to highlight here. Okay. Fair. Uh, we went with a different out or we went with a different conclusion that time. Interesting. Switching it up a little bit here at the very end. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm getting innovative. Oh, innovative. Okay. I respect it. Um, but I, I mean, I pretty much agree with everything you said. I like Quandre a lot, like I said. Um, and I think he, he'll be fun to watch in this defense because this type of defense, 
he's going to probably play closer up to the line a decent bit. And if that happens, he's going to need to be able to kind of play more man coverage, you know, come up to the line, find your guy, flip your hips, get down the field. And he can more than do that. He's got the athletic ability to do that. And if they're asking him to do that, I think he's going to absolutely kill it there. Like you said, he's really good at forcing turnovers, super opportunistic. He can tackle downhill very well. Um, and if you want to run, you know, switch back into the cover three, because Pete Carroll's there, there's going to be cover three ran at some point. He can play that uh, deep free safety role perfectly fine. So I think he fits very, very well with what they're going to want to do. And then you have Jamal Adams, like you said, who's kind of the question mark here, because he can't really run as a safety in quarter, uh, quarters because he's not going to be able to flip his hips and get downfield with somebody. Um, and, and in coverage, I mean, he just gets burnt all the time. He gets torched. He's just not there. I almost think they could try out, maybe it's not the long-term option, but maybe they could try him as like a star backer, kind of like uh, what Isaiah Simmons is apparently doing for uh, the, the Cardinals and kind yeah. of what Jalen Ramsey does just without the trying to put him on somebody in the sense that he would play like a glorified nickel on early down. So you can come up and have him play the run and kind of watch some of that shorter stuff. Cause I mean that you're not asking a whole lot of them in coverage doing that. Um, it, it's just kind of figuring out a spot for him. I could also see a world where they just say, fuck it and put him at linebacker. Cause if yeah. like Cody Barton doesn't pan out or Jordan Brooks can't step up, which, you know, like, doomsday scenario at that point but yeah yeah maybe you can throw him up there and get something out of him because jamal adams is a good football player he's just yeah. not a modern safety like if this was like the early 2000s late 90s and he could just be john lynch and just pop people fantastic player he would yeah he would fit in perfectly but it's 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 just not that anymore people are asking a lot more of safeties nowadays like we see derwin james or grant delpit uh with the Brown's the type of stuff he's going to be asked to do. You see these hybrid safeties that do so much, and Jamal Adams just can't do it. He just doesn't have the coverage ability to keep up. He, he's like the reverse of what everyone's trying to do now where they're putting a safety at linebacker. He's a linebacker at safety. And yeah. it's it just it straight up does not work. And if you put him into the box, that still leaves you with a liability back there because the safety room, uh, who was the guy you said? I've never even heard of him, if I'm being totally honest. Ryan Neal. Yeah, you've got him and Marquise Blair is there if he can even stay on the football field. Like it's it's yeah. it's a shoddy room. Like Quandre Diggs is great, but he has no help. It, mm. He has absolutely no help. Yeah, I don't. I I'm not even sure that Blair will make the team. He's been a total bust. Right. So there you go. Even further to my point, there's nothing yeah. there. So either Jamal Adams needs to step up and learn how to play coverage, which at this point in his career might just be a lost cause. Seems like a long shot, yeah. Yeah, or you're going to have to suffer. And, I mean, given the Seahawks team right now, they're probably going to go the suffering route. Um, yeah, we're going to be suffering in a lot of areas this year. Yeah. Speaking of which, what is your uh, – I, I, we'll go record prediction. How do you think this team's going to do? What's your record prediction here? I think okay, so I went through earlier this year to, for my like record prediction series and predicted mm -hmm. every game of the season. I think I gave them four. Okay, we're in the exact same boat then. That's all right. I, I could them. yeah, I could seeing it. I could see it be like five or six, um, I could depending too. on how well the offense is. Yeah. And then if Geno starts, I could also seeing it be two. Yeah, like th there's there's some some room for each side. There's some margin for error here. Yeah. Um, we obviously were in one of the rougher divisions, uh, but we seem to just own San Francisco. I think we get one out of them. Um, and then we play a couple like really good teams and a couple really bad teams. And I think we could get some out of there, but yeah, yeah. around four wins. Yeah. I've got them at four wins as well. I, for my record predictions, I've been doing a ceiling and a floor and I haven't quite determined what I'd put it at first Seattle, but I think the floor, like you said, probably around two, if I had to say something off the top of my head, in a ceiling, I don't know. I can't see him winning more than like seven, maybe eight. Yeah, it's, I've it's seen way too many year. people predict a playoff run. No, for Seattle, it's no. just it's even just in Seattle the weekend fans NFC, that are like no. spoiled. Yeah, spoiled. No yeah, there you go. Like I'm a Bears fan, and I I have them winning four to five games, and like I'm cool with that. I don't have the spoiled yeah. mentality of like, well, we've seen this team do worse and win with less. Like, no, you haven't. 
No, you have not. You've always had Russell Wilson. Now you have Drew Locke and or Geno Smith. There's yeah, that's the issue a- with like with with predicting records and stuff like that is because people will just base their team off of a team the year before that right. got a certain amount of wins as if like schedule doesn't change or like the standard for winning doesn't change. Players don't fall like, off, get hurt. Yeah, exactly. Develop, like, break it, out. It's like this is not a copy paste. It's roster. not Madden. Yes, exactly. That's, That's a good best way to put it. To put it. It's, it's not, not Madden. Madden. Like, I've seen so many Bears fans, they won six football games last year. Mm-hmm. And because Matt Nagy and Ryan Pace are gone, we have a new offense. Defense looks different. Justin Fields is going into year two. We are destined to win more than six games. More, yeah. <laughs> like, that, no, like, we if, are if that's not. That's worth everyone would be improving. And that's just yeah. not possible. Yeah. Like, it, it's very rare that on paper you get worse as a team. Like, only a couple team, teams do that per mm-hmm. offseason but the standard for winning raises your schedule will get harder and harder players oh my gosh players will get worse yeah but, yeah like i'll tell you right now i expect the bears to look like a more competent football team but they're they're not going to win more than six games six games is being extremely generous like i have them winning five and i think that's very generous but yeah. i'm also anticipating justin fields taking a nice step and i i, I don't I watched your Bears prediction, but I don't remember how you felt about the Bears. So, so I'm I'm very I'm pretty anti Bears. I'm, I'm anti Bears team building. I love Fields. Mm-hmm. I've always been a major major Fields truther. He was my quarterback too, coming out of that class behind Lawrence. You were higher on um, him than I was. Yeah, yeah. No, I love Fields. Um, my only issue is like I think that he is raw enough that he he needs some development and I don't like what is around him in terms of his development. Like I think that offensive line is a very critical role in developing mm-hmm. quarterbacks. And I guess less so with him because he's so mobile and mm-hmm. can use his legs really, really effectively. But um like if he hits the ceiling that I think that he can, he is going to be so legit for you guys. Mm-hmm. I just don't know what the yards are of him hitting that ceiling. Right. I think the thing is with Justin, the the new offense that they're going to be running, which is like copy and paste Shanahan. It, it's not the McVay. It's the straight up Shanahan where it's very right. run heavy, yeah. a lot of movement, a lot of play action, a lot of 12 personnel. That's going to be what we're running this year. And Justin's going to be outside of the pocket a lot. So while the offensive line matters – it matters more in the sense that you have guys that can get out and move rather than guys that can just hold their ground. And we do lack guys that can hold their ground. I'm not going to sit here and pretend we don't, but outside of like Cody Whitehair, all four of our five starters are projected to be pretty athletic dudes that can move around and let the pocket kind of work. And I, I, I'm not trying to hype up the bears offensive line or anything, but I think it's going to be a little bit better than what people think just based off the strength of the unit. Like we don't have big standout names, but Braxton Jones has looked incredible in camp. Cody Whitehair has been a solid starter for like 10 years now, just under 10 years. Uh, You've got Lucas Patrick, who's going to be coming off his thumb injury. He's a super intelligent, very team-oriented center. Tevin Jenkins looked great at guard, and that's his position going forward. And then we have um, Riley Reef, who's not terrible. He can hold his own. So it's going to be a lot of relying on those guys to just kind of buddy up, for lack of better words, and pick up stuff. You have uh, Cole Komet, who's a fantastic run blocker. You have David Montgomery, who's a very, very good run blocker out of the backfield. You're going to have Kari Blassingame, who's been a fantastic run blocker. Or I'm sorry, not run blocker. I'm talking about pass blocking here. Cole Komet's been a fantastic pass blocker. David Montgomery's been a fantastic pass blocker. Kari Blassingame is both ways. Great. He's a top five fullback. Um, and they've got... Uh, the two tight ends behind fields. I can't think of, it's O'Shaughnessy and I can't remember the other guy's name for the life of me, but that's what they are too. They're good blockers. There's a lot of guys that aren't the offensive line that are going to play a big role in blocking. And on top of that, when Komet's not blocking, he's going to be field safety blanket. We already saw the chemistry building in the preseason. And I, I know I'm alone on this, but I am very high on Cole Komet. I think Cole Komet is going to be a stud. 
I think he has, especially in a league right now where tight end talent is kind of few and far between, I think Cole Komet has top 10 upside. I think he can be great. It's just a matter of getting him the targets and letting him work. Because when we've seen him get targets, he's done work. Like his tight end numbers are low or touchdown numbers are low but he was in a Matt Nagy offense that doesn't score touchdowns, but he was like 13th in yards or something and was making dominant plays. And I think that's going to be a continuation this year. You're going to see a lot of him in the flat, just in kind of dumping it off to him. The first play we saw against Seattle, it was a tight end screen and he picked up like 12 yards on it. Like that's the type of player he is. And we're going to rely on him to do that a lot. And I think he can be good. I love Mooney. I think Mooney's going to have his big year and break out as the wide receiver one. Um, Byron Pringle, I don't think is great, but I think he's good enough to where you can get a, a solid amount of production out of him. He can be a, a solid receiver. I think he had like five, 600 yards as Kansas City's fourth receiver last year, plugging him at wide receiver too. I think you can get seven, 800 out of him. Um, Bayless Jones, while everyone clowns him for being old, is a quick fucker. Like he can move and the Bears are going to find ways to use him. Uh, I'm not going to say he's Debo Samuel because he's not, but you're going to find ways to get him the ball short and let him create because that's what he can do. Screen passes, uh, maybe a pop pass here and there, drags, whatever. It's, it's a completely different offense where Fields is going to have a lot of quarterback friendly stuff going on and he's going to be able to play to his ability. He's going to be outside of the pocket. He's going to be taking off. Fields was like number one uh, in... QB, like, I forget what's the right terminology for it, where you're just designing a quarterback outside of the pocket to throw the ball. He was so, like, um, I know what you mean. Yeah. Uh, it's not runs, but like when you're getting outside of the pocket to throw like, it. like scramble drill kind of. Like, yeah. Yeah. I, I know. I kind of know what you're, I know what you're talking yeah. about. I'm, but I'm it's, it's not scramble term. drill though. Cause it's designed. It's, 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 I mean, it's like bootlegs and stuff, but there's a specific name for it. Yeah. No, no, no. I know exactly yeah. what you mean. I'm he, blanking on the term right yeah. now. But he was like top five in the league in that. And the bears did it like 12 times throughout the entire season or something abysmal like that. Like that, that is fucking hearsay. Like that is terrible. You cannot do that with Justin Fields where the bears offense is going to be completely different. And he's also going to have the benefit of having a solid defense ran by a defensive mastermind on the other side who knows how to get the most out of his guys. Eberflus has never had a lower than like top 14 defense or something. And people underestimate how important a good defense is for a young quarterback, because as long as fields isn't having to put up 30, 40 points a game, the bears can commit to the run game. They have solid running backs. They can move. They uh, have people movers up front, like Tevin Jenkins and Cole Komet. The bears. I'm not, I, I know it sounds like I'm trying to hype them up to be great, it's going to be serviceable. It's going to look more competent than it did last year. And the vision is clear, I think. And I once you get some more talent, like obviously they need another receiver out there. Byron Pringle can't be your long-term wide receiver too, but he's good enough for Fields to show something. That's what I want this year. I don't want some crazy year two breakout like he's Patrick Mahomes. I want Fields to throw more touchdowns and interceptions and people to be like, oh, okay, that's why they traded up for him. I remember now. I'm sick of Dan Orlovsky being like, well, this kid's going to die back there. He's fucked. Like, shut up. I, I'm like, I, I'm, I want the narrative to change. That's what the Bears are going to do. There's going to be enough for the narrative to change. It's not going to be a superstar season. We're not coming anywhere near the playoffs. We're going to be last in the division, and we're going to be picking top 10. But people who actually sit down and watch the game, they're going to see the vision, and the narrative's going to be different. And that's that's my goal for them, and I think that's what's going to happen. Yeah, yeah, I, I I do like like what you guys have in terms of your young guys right now, like Mooney, Komet, all those guys. I just think that you guys should be in a better position right now than you are because of like multiple bad team building moves because of Ryan Pace. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so like, like the Eddie Jackson extension, for example, yes. is like one of the worst contracts in sports yes. right now. Like, it he's is. I think you guys went a little bit overkill on the pass rush between Quinn and Mac. Yes, and like I agree. You, the Khalil Mack trade was a mistake. I stand by that. Trading for Khalil Mack trade, was a mistake. Oh, oh trading for no, Khalil. Okay, no, I thought you meant getting rid of him needed to happen. I was all okay, on board. Okay, with that. But trading say, two yeah. first round picks for an edge rusher, paying him quarterback money when you don't have a quarterback on the roster, that's terrible practice. That is a mm -hmm. horrid decision. I get why yeah. they did it. They were a little bit too confident in Mitch, but in hindsight, terrible. Yeah, all of the problems set up with this team are Ryan Pace, and Poles is trying to play damage control. But because he didn't go out and sign Teron Armstead, draft a receiver with his first pick, uh, draft like 15 other offensive linemen, because he didn't do everything like that, he didn't go overkill, 
he's the bad guy. It's his problem. And I think Ryan Pulse has done a fantastic job this offseason of damage control. Yeah, like, I had a – so so I'm doing my, like, team prediction series right now. I had a series mm-hmm. before that during the season where it was, like, previewing a team's offseason – and because the Bears are so early in alphabetical order, um, I I did them. And my takeaway was, like, there's not a lot of room to work with here. Right. Like, That's the point. Nobody you, realizes that. Yeah. Like, like, you really can't do too much with the resources that you have right now. And I think the Bears did a good job. Like, exactly. With what they have. Um, was it going to – oh, Velas Jones. I was lower on him, but, like – how you talk about that, like Kyle Shanahan offense, like that is the perfect fit. Yeah, for exactly. Like that. And, exactly. And the Bears, the Bears have like, like before him, there was like zero guys who could create after the catch. They were and, last and, in the NFL in yards after reception last exactly, year. Yeah, right, so they went right. out and so got like, the best rack receiver in the draft, statistically yeah, like, speaking. Like, well, I while I might be lower on him, he is like a great fit for the offense yeah i don't think he's going to be a superstar talent or anything he's a gadget guy but he fits the scheme very well that's my point with him yeah like he's going to give fields easy opportunities and create easy yards and get first downs like that's all you need him to do i'm not saying he's going to be an elite slot receiver or something he's a gadget guy but he can do work in that type of offense right like i like you said the bears were in a horrid spot going into the off season and i like the fact that polls had the balls to trade khalil mack is like the first move he made that was perfect the bears got a great return for mack you get a second round pick and his money's gone that was perfect they weren't getting a first round pick for mack and if they did they would have had to eat half his salary which would have been the dumbest move possible they got rid of all of the salary they ended up drafting jaquan brisker with the pick who looks like a demon Jaquan Brisker is going to be a stud at the NFL level. And you go out in the draft, you draft a bunch of offensive linemen. They're probably not all going to work out, but Braxton Jones looks like he's going to be the day one starter. And like, I get it. He's a fifth round rookie. You're kind of hesitant on that, but he's looked really good. Like against Robert Quinn, he's held his own throughout practice. He held his own in that first, uh, in the first game. I didn't really get to watch him too much in the second game. Cause I was watching Tevin Jenkins, who by the way, should be a draft bust. But Ryan Poles and Matt Eberflus found a way to use him, and now he's going to be playing guard for us. Like, they've done a good – and then they got uh, other cheap talent like Nicholas Morrow, who's a super athletic Mike and fits Eberflus's defense very well. Um, they went out and got Tavon Young, who before he got hurt was like the best slot corner in football, and if he can play even like 60% of that, we'll be happy with him. Uh, they went out and got Kyler Gordon, who's a ball-hawking number two that'll fit great alongside Jalen Johnson. He handled the Roquan Smith situation beautifully, in my opinion. Um, I know there's a lot of controversy around that, but like Roquan requested a trade, and he didn't budge, he didn't move, and now Roquan's like, ah, fuck it, I guess I'll play. Like that's a, that's a win for the Bears GM, and now they're in a position. I made a TikTok about it right before we hopped on here, actually, where uh, polls can be like, okay, the issue is Roquan's playing in a different scheme now. He's the weak side linebacker in a four-three defense after being the Mike in a three-four. So because of that, we're trying to see if he can play well. He, for lack of better words, he's sh- uh, he's our Shaquille Leonard. That's what he's going to be for our defense. Like that that was Matt Eberflus's baby in Indianapolis. He developed Shaq Leonard. He made him into who he is. And Roquan Smith is going to be playing that exact role. So if Roquan shows that he's capable of handling it, because it's like the most important position in Eberflus's defense, they'll pay him whatever the fuck he wants. They're just waiting to see if he can do it. They're doing the same thing with David Montgomery to see if he can fit the new offense. Because he's up for an extension too. I think he's worth paying, but they're waiting to see if he fits. And he hasn't said a word. He hasn't said a peep. Props to Monty for that. I love it. Um, But they're playing it very smart. Just like going defense in the second round, your defense was horrid. You had the worst secondary in football last year, arguably. So you go out and get a corner, you go out and get a safety, and th- they both look great. All of Ryan Pohl's draft picks and even some of his UDFAs have looked great so far. And I know I'm going on a rant about the Bears, but like, I I, I had to, I just, I don't know, I love the team. And I'm very happy with what they've done, given what they had. Yeah, yeah like, I'll put it this way. I like what they have going forward. Yeah. I agree. Um, yeah, they, they were in a lot. They, they put themselves in too bad of a position this offseason than they – or, like, going into the offseason mm-hmm. than they should be right now. Yeah. Like I like I said, I think Ryan Poles did a great job playing damage control because Ryan Pace basically said 
here's the keys. The infrastructure is falling apart. The plumbing doesn't work. There's sewage coming up through the basement. There's a hole in the roof. Fix it. And he was like, okay. And he like kind of got it settled. There's still some issues. The house shakes when a, when there's a, a hard breeze, but like he's got a contractor coming in next off season to come fix it up. So I know that's a weird analogy, but like <laughs> it works. Yeah. That, I mean, that's what it is. He played damage control and I think he did well. Yeah. Um, but with the Seahawks, uh, back to the team we're supposed to be talking about, I know I just went on like a 15, 20 minute rant. Um, I, I think if they can find out, figure out the quarterback situation, the team long-term should project well. They've got a lot of nice young franchise cornerstones, like we've said, and uh, whether it's Locke or one of these rookies coming up, I think they're in a good position going forward. The only issue is that, well, I guess by the time they're competitive, the Rams probably won't be competitive anymore. So they'll be fighting it out with the Niners at that point. Yeah. Yeah. That should be, should be interesting. I'm, I don't know like when we are going to be good. It's going to be at least two to three years before we are like anywhere near playoff contention again. Um, But like the quarterback situation is so fuzzy for the future. um, It's, it's hard to tell. Yeah. Yeah. But like we've said, there's, there's good pieces in place. You just kind of got a very similar to the bears. You're just waiting to we're, see we're what they got. We're trending in the right direction. Yeah. Right. Right. You feel good going forward. Yeah. Not this year. Yeah, that's going all you forward. can ask. Yeah. That's, that's all you can ask. Yeah. yeah. You're not, you're not in limbo anymore. At the end of the day, that's what it is. You're not in limbo. Cause you were, you were in limbo as long as you had Russ oh, and now yeah. he's out of the building. And yeah. Is there anything we didn't uh, hit on that I missed or that we need to anything you want to bring up? I don't think so. I think All we're right. good. Well, if you want to plug anything, uh, you're more than welcome to do that now. Um, so it would be at JPOW NFL. Uh, you can see it on the screen probably at JPOW NFL on TikTok and Twitter. There you go. Uh, make sure you give him a follow. The kid clearly knows his stuff. Uh, you're celebrating what? A year on TikTok today? Yeah. Yeah. Today's a year. Yeah. Look at that. Oh, yeah. Uh, he's a. I can give him this title because it's the name of the podcast. He's a certified ball knower. So definitely oh, make sure to go check him out. Done it. <laughs> He's done it. Uh, All right. Well, well, I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have made it here without you, Miller. You were definitely one of the better mutuals I have come across for sure. Thank you. I appreciate it. But that's going to do it for this episode of the ball knower podcast team preview series. Uh, I know it was a little bit long. Well, it wasn't that long compared to the rest of them. It wasn't that bad. Um, <laughs> But thank you all for watching. I really appreciate it. Uh, make sure you let us know down in the comments below if you disagree with anything we said. I know I was very negative about Rashad Penny, and there's going to be some fanboys that are going to find that and attack me for it. Uh, and by all means, go ahead. Uh, I'll, I'll take the algorithm boost. Uh, and also make sure to leave a like because, like I said, we've been sitting here for two hours recording. It takes a hot minute to get these done. I would really appreciate the support. And uh, make sure to subscribe as well. We're pushing for 250 subs by the start of the uh, 2022 to 2023 NFL season. And we're currently at like 216. So we're getting there. We've got a couple more weeks. Maybe we can get there. Uh, but to everyone out there watching, and of course to my boy Jackson, I hope you all have a wonderful day, evening, afternoon, night, whatever time of day it is for you. I hope you enjoy it because you're all.